It'll mean a journey of 1,200 miles over rock and sand, by vehicle, camel, and on foot. And it's a dangerous journey. They call it the land of fear. It takes its name from the Arabic word for emptiness, Al-Zahara. The vast area that was submerged during the end of the Ice Age has never been studied by archaeology at all. And they're not in a position to say that they know that there's no possibility of a lost civilization during the Ice Age. While they haven't investigated those 27 million square kilometers that are now underwater, when they haven't investigated the Sahara Desert. When we think of the Sahara Desert, we think of endless sand. But what really lays beneath all the sand? The Sahara Desert, it's like a time machine preserving the ancient history of Earth under all that sand. The Nubian civilization, flourishing in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, is an incredible chapter of history that's often not as highlighted as it should be. This civilization, which stretched from around 2000 BCE all the way to 350 CE, shows us just how advanced and rich in culture, architecture and politics an ancient society could be. Imagine a civilization that lasted over two millennia, peaking during various periods like the Kingdom of Kerma, the Napatan period, and the Meroitic period. Nubia was strategically located along the Nile River, stretching from the first cataract in southern Egypt to the sixth cataract in central Sudan. This prime location along the Nile was not just for show, it played a huge role in establishing Nubia as a powerhouse of trade and economic activity. They were known for their abundant gold mines, which pretty much made them the go-to spot for luxury items like ivory, incense and ebony. These goods were highly sought after in both sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean world, making Nubia a crucial hub in ancient trade networks. In fact, that was one of the main arguments that the archaeological police used to try to dismiss John West and Robert Schock. Um, they said, uh, show us another culture that's 12,000 years old anywhere in the world and we might listen to you. But we know that there is no culture capable of creating anything like the Sphinx until 4,500 years ago. Therefore, of course, the Sphinx is 4,500 years ago. But, of course, that changed completely with Gobekli Tepe, which is uh, a deliberately buried site, deliberately buried 11,600 years ago. Now let's talk about Nubia's relationship with ancient Egypt. It was nothing short of complex and fascinating. The interactions ranged from trade and cultural exchanges to outright warfare and conquests. There were times when Nubian pharaohs actually ruled over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. This period is a testament to Nubia's strength and influence in the region. The kingdoms of Nubia, nestled along the Nile in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, really tell us a story of an incredibly rich history, full of architectural wonders. Let's take a closer look at what made these kingdoms so remarkable. Starting with Kerma, dating way back to around 2500-1500 BCE, it's fascinating to think this was the first centralized state in Nubia. It was more than just a political hub. Its strategic location on the Nile made it a hotbed for trade. The architecture here was quite unique too, with large mud brick structures called defufas. Their purpose? Well, that's still something of a mystery. Were they temples, palaces or something else? And let's not forget the artistry in their pottery and crafts, especially the black-topped red ware and their work with ivory and gold. Then there's Napata, around 1300 BCE, which really left its mark as a cultural and religious center. This is where Nubia began to exert its influence over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. Think about the Temple of Amun in Napata. It wasn't just a religious site, but a pivotal spot influencing Nubian culture and politics. And the royal burials of this time, with pyramids at sites like El Kuru and Nuri, show just how much Egyptian culture influenced them. Fast forward to around 300 BCE, 350 CE, and we see the capital shifting from Napata to Meroe. This move wasn't just geographical, it signified a shift in political and cultural power too. Meroe was a hub for the arts and industry, known especially for its iron industry and the development of the Meroitic script, an early African written language outside of the Egyptian hieroglyphic system. Part of now the problem is that very ancient structures, thousands of years older than archaeologists suppose, may be hiding in plain view. 
surrounded by other younger structures. And the best example of that really is the, is the Great Sphinx of Giza. And these two temples, these two temples in front of it. This temple is just is a New Kingdom temple much later the, even than the accepted date of the Sphinx, but, which is about 4,500 years ago. But the Sphinx and these two temples are deeply anomalous. Now let's talk about the architectural marvels of Nubia, the pyramids. Yes, Nubia had over 200 pyramids, mostly concentrated at places like El Kuru, Nuri, and Meroe. These weren't like the Egyptian pyramids we often think of. They were smaller, with steeper sides, and often featured elaborate carvings and hieroglyphics. These pyramids were royal tombs, and the burial chambers beneath them were often richly decorated. These pyramid complexes, part of larger royal cemeteries, included mortuary temples and chapels, showing a deep belief in the afterlife. The Garamantes civilization, centered in what's now southwestern Libya's Fezzan region, is a real eye-opener about how advanced ancient societies were, especially in such challenging environments like the Sahara. This area, known for its oasis environments, was crucial for sustaining life, and the Garamantes were pretty ingenious in adapting to these harsh conditions. So picture this. From around 500 BCE to 700 CE, the Garamantes were at their peak. This wasn't just a flash in the pan, it was a long period of development and stability. They were ahead of their time in agricultural techniques, urban planning, and establishing far-reaching trade networks. It's like they were the ancient masters of making the desert work for them. Archaeological digs in the region have unearthed some pretty cool stuff. For starters, they found these elaborate tombs, which really say a lot about their beliefs in the afterlife, something many ancient civilizations had in common. The complexity and size of these tombs also tell us there was a social hierarchy with different levels of wealth and status. The goods buried with the deceased give us a peek into their cultural practices and beliefs. The ruins of Garamantian cities are something out of an ancient urban planner's dream. They had organized street layouts that show a high level of social organization and civil engineering skills. What's more impressive is their water management systems. In a place as dry as the Sahara, they managed to create reservoirs and irrigation systems, which were crucial for their survival and agricultural activities. Plus, they had defensive structures hinting that they were prepared for potential threats. Now let's talk trade. They found Roman coins in the excavation sites, which means the Garamantes had trade connections with the Roman Empire. Imagine the caravans going back and forth across the desert. They also found Egyptian amulets and items from sub-Saharan Africa, showing that their trade network was vast and varied. The diversity of goods found at these sites underscores their role as a major trading hub and their interactions with different cultures. Uh, and weirdly, up there near Cuzco, we have this curious stonework, and we also have it at Alakahoyuk in Turkey. Exactly the same kind of thing. Is this a coincidence or is there something going on behind the scenes of history that we've not been fully informed about yet? Um, and, and, and oddly, these, these patterns, these T-shaped pillars that we see at Gobekli Tepe are repeated at the Temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt and uh, also in Peru. Now moving on, Tassili Najer in Algeria is truly one of those places that take you back in time all the way to the early days of human civilization. Nestled in southeastern Algeria, right in the heart of the Sahara Desert, this area is a treasure trove of history. Picture this, vast sandstone formations, cliffs, deep valleys and rock shelters. It's not just a stunning natural landscape. These features have been key in preserving some incredible prehistoric rock art. Now let's talk about this rock art. It's not just a few drawings here and there. We're talking about artwork that dates back to the Neolithic period, some as old as 12,000 years. Discovered by a French military expedition in the 1930s, these paintings give us a fascinating glimpse into the lives of the people who lived back then. You've got human figures, wild and domestic animals, and scenes that show everything from hunting and gathering to dancing and rituals. What's really interesting is how the art changes over time, starting with wild animals and hunting scenes and gradually moving to domesticated cattle and herding. It's like a visual story of how these ancient folks transitioned from hunting gathering to pastoralism. But it's not just about the art. Archaeologists have found all sorts of tools and pottery in Tassili Naja, indicating that people have been living here for thousands of years. These artifacts range from simple stone tools used by hunter-gatherers 
to more sophisticated items linked to settled communities. It's amazing how much you can learn about past lifestyles and technological progress just by looking at these objects. Now let's not forget about preserving this incredible site. Tassili Najer was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1982, which is fantastic because it helps in getting the support needed for its preservation. But keeping this site in good shape isn't easy. The art is facing threats from natural erosion and potentially even climate change. Plus, there's the impact of tourism. Sure, tourism raises awareness and brings in funds for preservation, but it also means more people walking around these precious artworks. When you think of the Sahara Desert today, it's all about vast stretches of sand and scorching heat, right? But believe it or not, this wasn't always the case. There's a whole hidden history beneath those dunes, and it's been uncovered through the study of fossils and isotope analysis. So let's dive into this hidden past. The Sahara has turned up fossils of all sorts of aquatic life. We're talking fish, mollusks, and even plants. And these aren't just any old fossils. They're often in great condition, which is pretty wild considering they've been under the desert for ages. These fossils got preserved because they were quickly buried under sediments in ancient lakes and rivers, which kept them safe from decay. And the dating of these fossils? It goes back millions of years, painting a long history of environmental change in the Sahara. Now these fossils tell us a lot about what the Sahara used to be like. Fish fossils suggest there were rivers and lakes around, while marine shells hint at the possibility of larger water bodies, maybe even shallow seas. Plus, the variety of species points to a time when the Sahara was home to rich and diverse ecosystems. But here's where it gets even more interesting. These fossils aren't just found in one spot, they're all over the Sahara, which means these water bodies were widespread. Satellite imagery and geological surveys have even mapped out ancient river systems that line up with where these fossils were found. And there's a lot of variation in the types and amounts of fossils in different areas, showing just how diverse the climate and environment were across the Sahara. Then there's isotope analysis, which is like a detective tool for figuring out past climates. By looking at the ratios of certain isotopes in sediment layers, scientists can work out past temperatures and rainfall. Higher ratios of oxygen-18, for example, usually mean more evaporation, pointing to warmer, drier periods. Carbon isotopes can tell us about the types of plants that were around, giving clues about how much rain there was. The archaeologists and the prehistorians, people are looking at that, have failed to take into account the severity of these events we're talking about. You don't realize the extent of the total remodeling of this planetary surface that took place. Because the question always is, where are the artifacts? Where's the pottery? Where is the, the evidence that this civilization existed? Randall Carlson's theory about advanced ancient civilizations is truly fascinating and a bit of a departure from what we usually hear in mainstream archaeology. He's suggesting that highly sophisticated societies might have existed tens of thousands of years ago, way before the traditional cradles of civilization like Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley and China came into the picture. Imagine civilizations thriving before or even during the last ice age, which wrapped up around 11,700 years ago. That idea alone pushes back the conventional timeline of human development by several thousand years. Now, when you look at the evidence Carlson brings to the table, it's primarily centered around those massive and mystifying megalithic structures scattered across the globe. Take the pyramids of Giza, for example. Their alignment with the stars of Orion's belt and the precision of their construction is just mind-blowing. Or Stonehenge with its solstitial alignment standing there on the Salisbury Plain. Two of these shafts um, go all the way through the body of the pyramid and exit on the outside and, and actually point at particularly significant stars. These structures suggest that the people who built them had a far more advanced understanding of astronomy than we usually give them credit for. Carlson dives into the engineering and architectural skills of these ancient builders. He talks about how they constructed these massive stone structures, some involving stones weighing several tons. Just think about the logistics of transporting and precisely placing these enormous stones over great distances. It indicates a level of engineering know-how and physical physics that seems way ahead of their time. Now moving on. Randall Carlson's theory about ancient civilizations is absolutely something different, isn't it? He really makes you think about the roots of our history in a new way. 
Just consider the megalithic structures scattered all over the world. When you account for the rise of sea level and the, the isostatic subsidence of the sea floor, it's not at all implausible that you had a large island complex in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. Carlson sees these as evidence of advanced prehistoric civilizations. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for example, is made up of over two million stone blocks, each weighing tons, and they're all placed with incredible precision. It's not just about the sheer size, but the sophistication in their construction. And it's not just in one place. These megalithic structures are everywhere, from the stone circles in Europe to the pyramids in Egypt and Mesoamerica. Carlson points out that the similarities in construction techniques and astronomical alignments across different cultures hint at a possibly shared or globally distributed source of knowledge. It's like these ancient builders were all tapping into the same advanced understanding, which is pretty mind-blowing to think about. Now, where it gets even more intriguing, is how Carlson links the disappearance of this advanced knowledge to catastrophic events. He often refers to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis, suggesting that a comet impact might have triggered drastic climatic changes at the end of the Ice Age. You may have periods of time where you have multiple impacts occurring over a short period of time associated with the destruction and disintegration of large comets. Imagine massive flooding, climate shifts, and entire civilizations collapsing. It's like something out of a movie, but Carlson suggests it could be what wiped out these advanced societies and their knowledge. But here's the thing. He thinks this lost knowledge didn't just vanish. According to Carlson, it lived on in myths, legends, and religious texts, which he sees not just as stories, but as historical records. Take the flood myths, for example, like Noah's Ark or the Epic of Gilgamesh. Carlson sees these as allegorical references to actual historical events, like massive post-glacial flooding. He believes that remnants of knowledge from these advanced civilizations were passed down through generations, albeit in a fragmented and symbolically encoded way. Moving back to megalithic structures, Randall Carlson's work on the astronomical alignments of megalithic structures is like peeling back layers of history to reveal the deep astronomical knowledge of ancient civilizations. Take the megalithic temples of Malta, Hagar Kim and Menadra, for instance. These structures aren't just old, they're among the oldest freestanding structures in the world, dating back to around 3,600, 3,200 BC. What's really remarkable about them is how they demonstrate an intricate understanding of celestial movements, particularly the solar cycle. When you look at these temples, especially during the equinoxes, it's like watching a celestial dance choreographed by ancient architects. At Menajdra on the equinoxes, the sunlight filters through a specific aperture, illuminating an inner stone slab. It's this incredible precision that highlights how the builders weren't just stacking stones, they were aligning them with celestial events, marking the change of seasons with architectural precision. But it's not just about alignments. The architectural design itself is a marvel. Some reference to such an event can be traced in many of the legends and myths surrounding these stars that have come down to us from nations far removed from each other. The layout of the temple seems carefully planned to align with the sun's position at significant times of the year. For example, the main axis of Hagar Chim is almost perfectly oriented to where the sun rises during the solstices. It shows a level of planning and understanding of the sun's movements. And then there's the construction itself. We're talking about huge megaliths, each weighing several tons, placed with such accuracy that they align with celestial events. It wasn't just a matter of brute force. It required sophisticated knowledge of astronomy and construction techniques. Plus, they used local limestone, which is abundant in Malta. The complexity of these temples goes beyond just their size or the weight of the stones. They have multiple apses, altars and intricate carvings, all forming part of a complex architectural design. The series of semicircular chambers connected by a central corridor and their alignment with specific astronomical events. The pyramids of Giza, especially the Great Pyramid, the precision with which these pyramids align to the cardinal points of the compass is just mind-boggling. Think about it. The Great Pyramid, built for Pharaoh Khufu around 2580-2560 BC, is aligned almost perfectly north, south, east and west. The northern side aligns to within a fraction of a degree of true north. Considering the era it was built in, that's an incredible feat of geometry and astronomy. The construction techniques themselves are a mystery. 
The ancient Egyptians might have used stars or the sun's path to find true north, which implies they had advanced surveying techniques and a deep understanding of angles and straight lines. It's impressive when you consider the tools and technology available at the time. Then there's the fascinating Orion correlation theory. This theory suggests that the layout of the three main pyramids at Giza mirrors the stars in Orion's belt. Proponents like Robert Beauval believe this alignment was intentional, reflecting a belief in the connection between the heavens and the afterlife. They speak of these two regions of the sky, the southern sky with the stars of Orion, and there's a move one slide up. Here's a nice view of them. They're pristine, by the way. It's really eerie how they carve those texts by hand, and some of the details is extraordinary. With Orion associated with Osiris, the god of rebirth and the afterlife, the pyramids in this view were not just tombs, but also celestial maps and gateways for the pharaoh's soul to the afterlife. The smallest pyramid, Menkaure's pyramid, is slightly offset, mirroring the offset of the smallest star, Mintaka, in Orion's belt, which adds another layer of intrigue to this theory. The design of the pyramids also incorporates alignments with the sun and specific stars and constellations. For example, certain shafts within the Great Pyramid align with particular stars. These could have been more than architectural features. They might have held spiritual significance, possibly serving as pathways for the Pharaoh's soul to the stars. Also, on specific days of the year, the sun sets between the pyramids, creating a visual spectacle likely significant in ancient Egyptian ceremonies. Now one of the most known megalithic structures. Would it be fair to say that there's an element of a rediscovery of a yes. lost technology from the past? I think it would be fair to say that, yes. Stonehenge, out there on the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. What's particularly fascinating about Stonehenge is its astronomical alignment and how it was constructed. The way it lines up with the summer solstice is probably what it's most famous for. On the longest day of the year, the sun rises right over the heel stone, which is set just outside the main stone circle. As the sun comes up, its rays shoot straight through the entrance and light up the center of the circle. Stonehenge also aligns with the winter solstice and possibly other celestial events. During the winter solstice, the sunset is framed by those massive stone trilithons, and some experts think it might even line up with lunar phenomena, which just adds another layer to how the builders understood both the sun and the moon's movements. When you think about how Stonehenge was built, it's even more mind-blowing. The final form was completed around 2500 BC, but it was built in phases over about 1,500 years. The main part of the monument is made up of these huge sarsen stones arranged in a circle, and there are smaller blue stones that were brought over from Wales. That's over 150 miles away. And then there's the layout of the stones. They're set up in this specific geometric pattern with an outer circle, an inner horseshoe arrangement, and those trilithon structures. The precision in the layout and how the stones are oriented show a really deep understanding of geometry and astronomy. It's not just a bunch of rocks placed randomly. Everything at Stonehenge is set up with purpose and meaning, which makes you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? If you mention the word Atlantis to, to any archaeologist, they will tend to roll their eyes. The fittingly named Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. When you look at all of the areas around the planet that have been proposed for Atlantis, I think there's one place that fits the majority of his details, and that's the sunken Azores Plateau. The Reichat structure, often referred to as the Eye of the Sahara, is a remarkable and unique geological formation with some fascinating features. Spanning about 40 kilometers in diameter, it's so large that it can be easily spotted from space. The structure isn't a perfect circle, but rather takes on a slightly elliptical dome shape, adding to its mystique. One of the most striking aspects of the Rishat structure is its series of concentric rings. These rings are quite intriguing because they're not all the same. They vary in terms of their width, what they're made of, and how they've eroded over time. This creates a complex, layered look that's quite captivating. The rim rock of this is late Cretaceous, about 90 million years old. So at that point, it was below the ocean, right? Mm. So it's been uplifted. I think this thing is about 14 or 1500 feet above sea level. So it's been eroded. You see this whole thing here is like an erosion. The way these rings have formed is a tale of erosion at work. 
Over millions of years, forces of nature like wind and water have eroded the dome, unveiling these distinct rings. Each layer of the structure erodes differently, depending on how tough or soft it is, which is why we see this range of rings. Now let's talk about what the Rishat structure is made of because it's quite a mix. The outer rings are primarily made of something called Proterozoic Quartzite. This is a very hard rock that's resistant to weathering, and it's incredibly old. We're talking over 600 million years. Quartzite forms from sandstone that's been put under a lot of heat and pressure, so it's been through a lot. As we move towards the inner rings, the story changes. Here we find softer, sedimentary rocks like limestone and sandstone. Limestone, primarily composed of calcium carbonate, typically forms in old marine environments. Sandstone, on the other hand, is made up of sand-like mineral particles. Right at the center, the Rishat structure has something called silicious breccia, which is basically a bunch of angular rock fragments stuck together. Breccia usually forms in areas with lots of volcanic activity, or where the Earth's crust has been moving and shaking. All these different rock types in one place make the Rechat structure quite special. Not only is it a visually stunning landmark, but it's also a valuable spot for geologists to study. So the connection to ancient Egypt that Solon draws and Plato passes on is actually very real. It's very, it's very solid. And I'm pleased to say that there has now been a full translation of the Edfu text. When it comes to how the Rishat structure was formed, there are a couple of theories floating around. The most widely accepted one is what geologists call the uplifted dome theory. In simple terms, this theory suggests that natural forces beneath the Earth's surface pushed up layers of rock, creating a sort of bulge on the surface. Over time, this dome was worn down by erosion, which is basically the wind and water gradually wearing away the rock. This erosion didn't happen uniformly, the softer rocks wore down faster than the harder ones, leading to the formation of those distinctive concentric rings we see today. Now, there's another, more speculative theory proposed by Jimmy Corsetti. He's got this interesting idea that the near-perfect circular shape and unique layering of the Rychat structure might not be all natural. He thinks that ancient human activities might have played a part in shaping it. The circular ring city was also said to have an opening to the sea at the south, which not only matches the southerly opening of the Rishat anomaly, but it even has existing evidence of a flow of salt water that is still visible to this day. The environment of the Sahara Desert has also played a significant role in the process of the Rychat structure formation. The dry, arid conditions mean that wind erosion is particularly influential in shaping the structure. And let's not forget that the Sahara hasn't always been a desert. It has gone through various climatic changes over millions of years, and these changes have influenced the rate and nature of erosion in the region. Some of the rocks there are incredibly old, dating back to over 600 million years ago. This period covers a huge chunk of our planet's past, from about 2.5 billion to 541 million years ago. It's a crucial era for understanding how continents formed and how early life evolved. Now, imagine the amount of time it took to form the Rechat structure. It's been shaped over millions and millions of years. A lot of factors played a role in shaping the Rishat structure. Movements in the Earth's crust, like the shifting of tectonic plates, have been a big part of it. Then there's the impact of climate changes over the ages, especially in the Sahara region. All these changes influenced the patterns of erosion that gave the structure its current look. And speaking of erosion, it's been the main force sculpting and exposing the different layers of rock in the Rychat structure. One of the coolest things about the Rishat structure is its distinct circular pattern. As said before, it's so noticeable that astronauts use it as a landmark when they're up in space. This pattern really stands out against the surrounding desert landscape. If you take the concept of Atlantis seriously, you're regarded by archaeologists and their friends in the media as a kind of lunatic. And I've always found this odd because, because the source, the earliest surviving source for the tradition of Atlantis, is the highly respected figure of Plato. Plato's description of Atlantis, found in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias, really captures the imagination, doesn't it? Written around 360 BC, these works come from a time when Athens was at the height of its philosophical and cultural influence. Plato was a thinker who loved to dive deep into ideas about society, morality and reality, and he used these dialogues as a way to explore these themes. It's kind of like he was having a conversation through his characters which let him present different ideas and arguments. 
Now, about Atlantis itself, it's described as this massive island city located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which most people think is the Strait of Gibraltar. Plato went all out in describing it as bigger than Libya and Asia combined, which really paints a picture of its mythical size. The city layout is fascinating, with these concentric circles of land and water. Imagine the engineering it would have taken to build something like that in ancient times, complete with canals and bridges connecting everything. The heart of the island, its central plain, was said to be super fertile, perfect for farming, and it was surrounded by high mountains rich in resources and natural protection. And Atlantis wasn't just about impressive landscapes, it was also a hub of resources and technology. Plato talks about it having all sorts of metals, including this mysterious orichalcum as well as gold and silver. The infrastructure was top-notch, with water systems, temples, palaces and docks. But Atlantis wasn't just about buildings and resources. Plato describes it as having a complex society with its own laws, customs and political organization. It even had a powerful military. Yet in his story, Atlantis starts as this ideal place and then becomes corrupt and ultimately falls. Plato includes precise scientific information in the story. And this is what archaeology is ignoring uh, when it says that it's all a fantastical made-up tale. And it, it's to do with that meltwater pulse 1B that I mentioned that, uh, that, that brought the Younger Dryas to an end 11,600 years ago and raised sea levels massively. Now let's talk about the theory connecting the Rishat structure, also known as the Eye of the Sahara, to the legendary city of Atlantis, as described by Plato. It's quite a fascinating topic, especially the ideas presented by Jimmy Corsetti. Here's where it gets interesting. Corsetti and some others have pointed out that these rings bear a striking resemblance to Plato's Atlantis, which in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias was described as having similar concentric circles of land and water. Now, while geologists understand these rings in the Rishat structure as a result of natural erosion processes, the similarity to the mythical Atlantis has sparked quite a bit of interest and speculation. When you compare the size of the Rishat structure to what Plato described for Atlantis, there seem to be some parallels, although there are notable differences in the exact measurements. Corsetti's theory even suggests that changes like erosion over time could have altered the Rishat structure's appearance, possibly bringing it closer to what Plato described. But here's a major twist in the tale. The Rishat structure is smack in the middle of the Sahara Desert, while Plato's Atlantis was described as an island in the Atlantic Ocean. This stark difference in geographical context has led to some interesting speculation. Some theorists propose that the landscape around the Rishat structure might have been very different in the past, possibly closer to water or even more hospitable than the Sahara we know today. And he's shown writings on the walls by the priests. And he says, what do these writings say? And the priests then unravel the whole story of Atlantis and they tell how there was this great advanced civilization. Uh, which, uh, which at one time was, was extremely beneficial and positive to the world, but which fell out of harmony with the universe. The Eye of the Sahara is quite an archaeological goldmine. In this particular region, a variety of artifacts have been found, shedding light on the lives of people who lived there thousands of years ago. We're talking about stone tools like arrowheads, scrapers and axes that were probably used for hunting and crafting. These tools tell us a lot about the daily activities and skills of these ancient folks. Then there's the pottery. Finding fragments of pottery in the area is like getting a glimpse into their domestic life. It shows that they had developed pottery-making skills, which is a big deal in understanding the cultural and technological progress of any civilization. And you know what's even more intriguing? There are hints of more permanent forms of settlement, Although it's not definitive, the remnants of structures could mean that these were not just nomadic people passing through, but a community that settled down. But here's where it gets really interesting, the rock paintings and engravings. These are found on cliff faces and in caves right around the Rishat structure. The artwork is not just beautiful, it's like a storybook of ancient life. There are paintings of animals like antelopes, elephants and giraffes, suggesting a time when the Sahara was teeming with wildlife. Then there are human figures depicted in various activities, giving us a sneak peek into their social and cultural practices. And the symbols and abstract designs might even point to their spiritual beliefs. Dating these rock arts can be tricky, but many are believed to be from the Neolithic period. This suggests that the region had a thriving community during that era. 
It's not just about finding old stuff, it's about piecing together the story of human habitation and development in the area. The presence of these artifacts and artworks indicates that there was a stable human population at some point. The possibility of permanent settlements, while not confirmed, is certainly tantalizing and calls for more extensive archaeological research. These findings are like puzzle pieces that help us understand the prehistoric Sahara, which was once a greener, more hospitable place than it is today. They tell a story of human adaptation and migration, of how people responded to the climatic changes that turned the Sahara into the desert we know now. It's not just about the history of a particular region, it's about adding to the rich tapestry of African prehistory and understanding the diversity and complexity of early human societies on the continent. Isn't it amazing how much we can learn about our past from the things left behind in the sands of time? So this, if it were true, and it is true, would put the Sphinx back to a much earlier period, which would tie in with Schwaller's work and John Anthony West's subsequent work, that there were indications that dynastic Egypt as we know it going back to about 3000 BC was really a legacy of what I call now an earlier cycle of civilization. Robert M. Schock, a geologist with a PhD from Yale University, came up with a fascinating idea in the 1990s about the age of the Great Sphinx of Giza. He noticed something interesting about the erosion patterns on the Sphinx and the surrounding area. Unlike the typical wind and sand erosion you'd expect in Egypt's deserts, these patterns looked more like they were caused by water. This was a big deal because it suggested that the Sphinx might be much older than we thought. Now, Graham Hancock, a well-known British author who loves digging into ancient mysteries, found Shock's theory really interesting and started supporting it. Since the early 1990s, question marks have been raised over the age of the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. Egyptologists think it's about 4,500 years old, although there's not a shred of inscription evidence to support this date. Independent researcher John Anthony West and Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University, have made a case that the Sphinx must be much older than that. Hancock is known for questioning the usual stories we hear about historical and archaeological sites. Schock's theory caught his eye because it suggested that the Sphinx was around during a time when Egypt had a lot of rain, which was way back around 8,000 to 10,000 BCE. This idea of heavy rainfall leading to the erosion we see on the Sphinx today is really cool, but also quite controversial. You see, traditionally, archaeologists have dated the Sphinx to around 2,500 BCE, during Pharaoh Khafre's time. They base this on where the Sphinx is located in the Giza Pyramid Complex and how it looks compared to other stuff from that period. But if Shock is right and the Sphinx was actually built when it was much wetter in Egypt, then it could be thousands of years older than we thought, maybe even dating back to the Neolithic era. That's a pretty big shake-up in how we think about ancient Egyptian history. To put it bluntly, the Sphinx did not originate with Khafre in the uh, Fourth Dynasty and really the beginning of my serious work and career looking at ancient civilizations. Instead of the typical wear and tear you'd expect from wind and sand in a desert, the Sphinx had features like deep cracks, wavy lines on its limestone walls, and smooth, rounded edges. These are the kinds of things you usually see with water erosion, not wind or sand. Now the Sphinx is made out of limestone, which is pretty easy for water to wear down. And what's interesting is that this limestone is made up of different layers, some harder than others. Shock saw that the water erosion affected these layers in a way that you wouldn't really see if it was just wind and sand doing the damage. But here's where it gets even more intriguing. Shock looked at the climate history of the Sahara Desert and the Giza area and found out that way back between 10,000 and 5,000 BCE, this place wasn't the dry desert we know today. It was actually pretty wet, thanks to something called the Neolithic subpluvial phase. We know there were ultra hyper arid Sahara conditions on the Giza Plateau for the last 5,000 or so years. And this ties in with the origins of civilization, according to the standard story, which is that civilization began between 4,000, 3,000 BCE. This was a time when there was a lot more rain. So Shock thinks that this rainy period might have caused the kind of water erosion we see on the Sphinx, suggesting it's much older than we thought, maybe even dating back to these wetter times. 
This goes against the usual dating of the Sphinx to around 2500 BCE during Pharaoh Khafre's reign, based on its style and where it's located in the Giza pyramid complex. Schock's idea definitely shakes things up in terms of how we think about the Sphinx's age. So Robert Schock didn't just look at the Sphinx in isolation when he was thinking about this whole water erosion idea. He actually compared the wear and tear on the Sphinx with other ancient limestone sites that had been exposed to a lot of rain. This was his way of checking if what he saw on the Sphinx matched up with known patterns of water erosion elsewhere. It's like looking at different worn-out jeans to figure out if they got ripped from climbing trees or just from washing them a lot. He found sites with a clear historical background where they knew for sure that rain had done its thing over the years. When he looked at these places, he noticed that the erosion patterns were quite similar to what he was seeing on the Sphinx. This kind of bolstered his argument that the erosion on the Sphinx could really be from water, not just wind or sand. You look at the evidence, and that's really where I was coming from, but my point is that even in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when I first got involved with this, if I looked at it critically, the evidence was not that definitive for the age of the Sphinx. Schock's approach was pretty comprehensive. He wasn't just a geologist looking at rocks. He was also considering the weather patterns from thousands of years ago and what archaeologists were saying about these ancient sites. It's like he was piecing together a big jigsaw puzzle from different fields of study. But of course, there are always different sides to a story. Some critics pointed out that the erosion could be due to other natural processes unique to the Giza area, like fluctuations in groundwater, or the way certain chemicals in the air might wear down the rock. And then there's the whole thing about what archaeologists have found around the Sphinx, like artifacts and writings that suggest it was built around 2500 BCE, during Pharaoh Khafre's time, this kind of goes against Schock's idea that the Sphinx is way older because of the water erosion. So it's a bit of a puzzle with some pieces still missing. Graham Hancock has this really intriguing idea about an ancient civilization that he thinks existed way before the ones we usually learn about in history books, like the Egyptians, Sumerians and the Indus Valley folks. He reckons this civilization was around many, many millennia earlier, and that it might have been wiped out by a huge comet impact around 10,000 BCE. Imagine that a whole advanced society just gone in the blink of an eye, leaving only bits and pieces behind. And here's where it gets even more interesting. Hancock thinks this civilization wasn't just hanging out in one spot. It was all over the place, having a global influence. He suggests that after whatever disaster hit them, the survivors might have traveled far and wide, sharing their knowledge and helping kickstart other ancient cultures Hancock dives into myths and oral traditions from all over the world too. He's not just dismissing these stories as old wives' tales, but considering them as potential historical records. For example, he's really interested in the flood myths that pop up in different cultures. He thinks these might be a collective memory of a real event that had a huge impact on this lost civilization. The best explanation is that floods of icy meltwater released by the heat and kinetic energy of the impacts flowed off the North American ice cap and into the Atlantic Ocean, where they interrupted the Gulf Stream, a key element of the central heating system of our planet, hence the sudden and dramatic cooling. Now Hancock is big on astronomy. He points to how some ancient structures, like the Giza pyramids and the Sphinx, line up with certain stars and constellations. He thinks this isn't just a coincidence, but a sign of advanced astronomical knowledge. He's also into the idea that these ancient folks understood the precession of the equinoxes. That's a fancy term for a slow shift in Earth's rotation over a 26,000 year cycle. If he's right, it means they were way ahead of their time in understanding the cosmos. Graham Hancock has this captivating theory about ancient civilizations and their architectural wonders. He's really into how these old structures like the pyramids in Egypt, Stonehenge, and those incredible megalithic sites in South America show off some serious engineering and architectural skills. Hancock reckons that to build these things with such precision and detail, those ancient folks must have had some advanced knowledge and technology that we don't usually give them credit for. Take, for instance, the way the stones are cut at Pumapunku in Bolivia. Hancock points out that the cuts are so precise it's as if they had access to some really advanced tools. And when it comes to building massive structures, he's all about the techniques they must have used. He's amazed at how accurately these huge stones were fitted together, often without any mortar, and wonders how on earth they moved and positioned stones that weigh several tons. This isn't just your everyday heavy lifting. 
We're talking about some serious know-how in engineering and possibly some clever uses of leverage and pulley systems. Now he doesn't stop there. He's also fascinated by the mathematical and geometrical knowledge that these structures reveal. He talks about the use of the golden ratio, pi, and precise angular measurements, which shows a sophisticated understanding of math and geometry. Like, take the Great Pyramid of Khufu. Its alignment, the way its base is perfectly level, and the precise angles of its sides, Hancock sees this as evidence of a much more advanced understanding of geometry and engineering than we might think. Then there are the monumental buildings in Mesoamerica, such as the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan and the Mayan Pyramids. Hancock highlights their architectural sophistication, urban planning, and the use of large stone blocks. All of this, to him, points to a level of technological proficiency and knowledge that goes way beyond what we've traditionally thought was possible for these ancient cultures. In a nutshell, Hancock is looking at these ancient structures and saying, hey, there's more to the story here. He's suggesting that these civilizations had a depth of knowledge and skill in construction, engineering and mathematics that challenges our conventional understanding of ancient history. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. And if we then consider the possibility that the Olmecs may just be the latest, the, the, the earliest surviving manifestation of that calendar, it could go back. Then there's Teotihuacan in Mexico. Hancock looks at the layout of this ancient city and sees a kind of mirror image of our solar system's planetary orbits. To him, this suggests that the people who built Teotihuacan had a pretty detailed knowledge of astronomy and space. Stonehenge in England is another example. Hancock thinks it was used as an astronomical observatory because of how it aligns with the solstices. He sees this as further evidence that ancient people understood celestial movements really well. And let's not forget about the Pyramid of Kukulkan at Chichen Itza. During the equinoxes, this pyramid casts a shadow that looks like a serpent. Hancock sees this as a sophisticated way of tracking the sun's path, again showing an advanced understanding of astronomy. Hancock also dives into the idea of precession, which is this slow wobble in Earth's rotation that takes about 26,000 years to go full circle. He looks at how the Giza pyramids align with Orion's belt, and how the Sphinx lines up with the Leo constellation during what's known as the Age of Leo, around 10,500 BCE. He thinks these alignments aren't random but deliberate, showing that the people back then understood this complex astronomical phenomenon. So, in a nutshell, Hancock is really into the idea that ancient structures around the world weren't just built for the heck of it. He believes they were deliberately aligned with stars, constellations and celestial events, showing that ancient civilizations had a much deeper understanding of astronomy than we usually give them credit for. Definitely a hall of records containing uh, a sort of time capsule from a forgotten episode in human history. What is concealed there touches on the fundamental mystery, the mystery of the immortality of the human soul. The concept of the Hall of Records is an intriguing blend of mysticism, archaeology, and speculative history, largely stemming from the visions of Edgar Case and the theories of Graham Hancock. Edgar Case, known as the Sleeping Prophet, was an American clairvoyant who claimed to access a wealth of knowledge in a subconscious state. During his trance-like states, Casey spoke of a Hall of Records, a repository containing the wisdom and history of a long-lost civilization believed to be Atlantis. This mythical island nation, famously mentioned in Plato's dialogues, was, according to Casey, a hub of advanced technology and spiritual knowledge. Casey had no apology for the limits of his psychic ability, though he continued to make world predictions he never considered himself a prophet. Casey's visions placed one of these halls beneath the Sphinx in Egypt, suggesting it held records from Atlantis, including cosmic knowledge and advanced technologies. He also mentioned two other locations, one underwater near the Bahamas and another in the Yucatan region, linked to the ancient Maya. His description of Atlantis painted it as an advanced civilization, aware of its impending doom, who created these halls to preserve their knowledge for posterity. Enter Graham Hancock, a writer known for his alternative historical narratives. Hancock has been deeply interested in the Hall of Records, seeing its potential discovery as supporting evidence for his theories of a prehistoric advanced civilization. I think the key thing is we're, we're looking at technologies that 
are not the same as ours. Yes. And that's yes. partly that's why archaeologists can't see them because they're looking for us in the past and they're not open to the possibility that there are whole other kinds of technology that could be used. He believes this civilization existed during the last ice age and was lost to a global cataclysm. For Hancock, the Hall of Records isn't just a mythical concept, but could be a real repository of lost knowledge. He speculates that it might contain detailed astronomical data and advanced technologies that could challenge our understanding of ancient civilizations Hancock's theories suggest that such a discovery could bridge the gap between myth and historical fact, providing tangible proof of a once globally influential civilization with profound knowledge in astronomy and architecture. We're looking at the clues that lead to specific locations. That shaft which led to that doorway was always a clue. The opening of that shaft was sealed until 1872. The last five inches of stone over the mouth of that shaft had been left deliberately in place. Now moving on, the discovery of the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion off the coast of Egypt has been a remarkable window into the past, unveiling a wealth of information about the ancient world. Located strategically near the canopic mouth of the Nile, north of Abukir Bay, Thonis Heracleion was a pivotal maritime hub. Its position was crucial for navigation and commerce, bridging the Nile River with the vast Mediterranean Sea. The city, with its natural harbour shielded by a chain of islands, thrived as a major port, a testament to its urban and architectural prowess as indicated by the remnants of a network of canals, docks and temple complexes. Rediscovered in the early 2000s, Thonis Heracleion had been submerged and lost for centuries before French underwater archaeologist Frank Godio and his team, employing advanced techniques like sonar scanning, brought it back to light. This monumental discovery, made in collaboration with the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, ensured that the findings were well documented and preserved. The utilization of cutting-edge technology in underwater archaeology has been pivotal in mapping the city's layout and recovering artifacts, offering us a clearer picture of its past. Dating back to at least the 12th century BC, Thonis Heracleion was more than just a city. It was a bustling hub during its heyday in the late Pharaonic and early Greco-Roman periods. As a significant commercial center, it played an integral role in the Mediterranean trade network, dealing in goods like grain, papyrus, precious metals and spices. But its significance wasn't limited to trade alone. The city was a cultural melting pot, blending Egyptian, Greek and Roman cultures. This amalgamation was reflected in the diverse range of artifacts unearthed, including statues and inscriptions, showcasing various artistic styles and cultural influences. The city's religious significance cannot be overstated. With its large temples and sanctuaries dedicated to numerous Egyptian gods and goddesses, Thonis Heracleion was a spiritual beacon, especially known for hosting the annual Mysteries of Osiris rituals. Politically, too, it was a powerhouse, serving as a primary entry point for foreign diplomats and traders to Egypt, and playing a crucial role in international relations. Its administrative significance was also marked, given its role in tax collection and governance. The Society for American Archaeologists claimed that they could absolutely for certain be sure that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. They knew it was a fact, and if there had been any civilization, they would have found it, right. and they would have published it. The archaeological treasures unearthed from the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion have been absolutely incredible, each offering a unique glimpse into the life and times of this ancient Egyptian city. For starters, the discovery of over 64 ancient shipwrecks is remarkable. It's not just the number that's impressive, but also their state of preservation. These wrecks are like time capsules, giving us a real sense of the maritime activities that once buzzed in this port. They tell us about the shipbuilding techniques of the era, how these vessels were designed, constructed, and the materials used. The diversity of ships, from grand cargo vessels to smaller boats, paints a picture of a bustling harbour engaged in a wide range of maritime endeavours, and the cargo remnants, including amphorae and various trade goods, speak volumes about Thonis Heracleion's extensive trade network. Then, there are the anchors, about 700 of them. This is unheard of in underwater archaeology and speaks to the sheer scale of the port's operations. The size and design of some of these anchors suggest they were used by large, heavy ships, showcasing the port's capacity and technological prowess at the time. The materials used, 
stone, metal reflect not just the resources available but also the level of craftsmanship and maritime technology of the period. The statues they found are simply awe-inspiring. Imagine coming face to face with a 16-foot tall statue underwater. These statues, representing gods, goddesses, pharaohs and perhaps significant city figures, give us a window into the religious and political life of Thonis Heracleon. Made from granite and diorite, they're not just huge, they're also beautifully crafted, a testament to the city's wealth and its cultural significance. Gold coins are another major find. The substantial quantity of coins discovered indicates the city's economic prosperity. These coins span across various eras and rulers, providing a timeline of the city's prominence and its connections in trade. They're solid proof of Thonis Heracleon's active role in regional and international trade networks, there are, you have to be careful when you look at underwater structures. You have to look at all the conditions that have led to their submergence. And, and in some cases, it's very clear that they've been underwater for a very, very, very long time indeed. Thonis Heracleon is like a treasure trove for anyone fascinated by ancient civilizations. The way this city was laid out tells us so much about the people who lived there and their advanced understanding of urban planning. They had a network of canals, roads and buildings all systematically arranged, which is pretty impressive when you think about how old this city is. These canals were crucial for transport and trade, functioning like water-based roadways. It's amazing to imagine boats navigating these waterways as part of daily life in the city. Then there's the city's architecture, particularly its temples. Thonis Heracleon wasn't just a trading hub, it was a religious center too. The temples there were dedicated to various deities like Amun and Heracles, showcasing the religious diversity of the time. These weren't just simple structures, they were architecturally grand with large columns, statues and intricate carvings. It's fascinating to think about how these temples were not only places of worship, but also centers for social and cultural activities. They played a significant role in the daily life of the city. The city's role as a cultural hub is further highlighted by the artifacts found there, which show a blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman influences. I think we're looking at something from Alexandria here. Yes. Yeah, we are. We are. I've dived there as well. That's inundated not because of sea level rise, but because of subsidence of the Nile silts. Uh... Moving on to more underwater locations in Egypt, Cleopatra's palace in Alexandria is truly a fascinating subject especially when you dive into its location, historical context, and the treasures it held. Nestled in the eastern harbor of Alexandria, the palace was not just any royal residence. It was located in the most prestigious part of the city, known as the Royal Quarter. This was where the heart of political and cultural activity in the Ptolemaic period beat the strongest. Now think about Cleopatra Sevevan, the figure to whom this palace belonged. She was the last pharaoh of the Ptolemaic kingdom, renowned for her intelligence, charisma and her liaisons with figures like Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. The palace, from its architecture to its contents, was a reflection of her power and prestige. Imagine a grand structure combining traditional Egyptian and Hellenistic architectural elements with lavish decorations and intricate detailing. It wasn't just a place to live, it was a statement of power and culture. The palace was probably filled with lush gardens and courtyards, offering a peaceful retreat in the midst of a bustling city. And given Alexandria's reputation as a center of learning and scholarship, it wouldn't be surprising if Cleopatra's palace housed extensive libraries and study areas. This would have been a place where the intellectual elite of the period gathered. The grand reception halls in the palace would have been venues for diplomatic events and political discussions, playing a crucial role in the international politics of the era. The artifacts and architectural elements discovered from this palace are like pieces of a historical puzzle. Statues, possibly depicting Cleopatra, Ptolemaic rulers and Egyptian gods, made from materials like granite and basalt, give us a glimpse into the artistic excellence of the time. The columns and other architectural fragments found at the site tell a story of opulence and artistic fusion, where Greek and Roman influences blended with Egyptian motifs. And then there are the sphinxes, symbolizing royal power and religious significance, perfectly illustrating the cultural synthesis that was characteristic of the Ptolemaic period. These discoveries are not just about Cleopatra's personal tastes. They provide a deeper understanding of the Ptolemaic society during her reign. The blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman elements found in the palace's architecture and artifacts reflects the rich cultural diversity and exchange that occurred under Cleopatra's rule.
One thing that they used to say is Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it. Right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. Graham Hancock's interpretation of the Piri race map created in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis, presents a fascinating narrative about the knowledge of ancient civilizations. The map, discovered in 1929 in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, has only about one-third of its original content preserved. Despite this, the map's detail and coverage, including parts of Europe, North Africa and the Brazilian coast, are noteworthy. The scale of the map is inconsistent, a common feature in early cartography, and it includes various annotations and illustrations. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. Piri Reis himself indicated that the map was compiled using various earlier sources, including charts from Christopher Columbus and possibly older maps, which might have included Western and Eastern, including Arabic navigational charts. Hancock's interpretation of the map primarily focuses on its depiction of the Antarctic coastline. He claims that the map shows the northern coastline of Antarctica in a largely ice-free state, which, according to him, last occurred more than 6,000 years ago. This assertion, if true, would imply a significant historical anomaly, suggesting that ancient seafarers might have charted Antarctica long before it was officially discovered. However, this interpretation is contentious. Critics argue that the so-called Antarctic coast could be a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the South American coast, or even an imaginative addition, not uncommon in early cartography. In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1880 by our civilization. It incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. Another intriguing aspect of the Piri race map, according to Hancock, is its accuracy in longitude in certain sections. He posits that this level of accuracy indicates a more advanced knowledge of navigation and geography than what was available at the time. However, this claim is debated by scholars who argue that the accuracies could be coincidental or exaggerated since accurate methods for measuring longitude were not developed until the 18th century. Hancock also suggests that the map depicts mountain ranges in Antarctica, which were unknown and under ice until recent times. This, he believes, further points to ancient knowledge of geography. Critics, however, counter that these features could be inaccuracies, such as misdrawn coastlines or symbolic illustrations, rather than representations of actual geographical features. Graham Hancock's hypothesis about advanced ancient knowledge, particularly as seen through the lens of ancient maps like the Piri Rice map, certainly stirs up a conversation about our understanding of historical and archaeological knowledge. Hancock points out that these maps display a level of geographical detail that seems remarkably accurate, especially when you consider the time they were created. For example, the Piri Race map, which includes detailed coastlines and island locations, seems to suggest a level of knowledge that surpasses what was known or should have been possible at the time. It's quite intriguing, really. One of the more captivating aspects of Hancock's theory is the suggestion that some of these maps show features that were not officially recognized until much later. Well, this map was drawn in 1813. It's the Pinkerton world map, um, and it's based on the latest science available in 1813. So Antarctica isn't there. Why isn't Antarctica there? Because it's an honest map. They hadn't discovered it in 1813. So it's very odd in my view that Antarctica appears on much older source ma maps, which themselves are based on even older source maps. Um, Take, for instance, his interpretation of the Antarctic coast as depicted on the Piri Reis map, a region not known in the 16th century. This leads Hancock to speculate that these maps could have been based on even older sources, possibly from a forgotten civilization that had extensively charted the globe. It's as if he's hinting at a lost chapter in human history. 
one that recorded the Earth with surprising accuracy and detail. When we dive into the technological implications of his theory, things get even more interesting. Hancock suggests that the creators of these original source maps must have had advanced navigational skills, including the accurate measurement of longitude. A significant challenge that wasn't resolved until much later with the invention of marine chronometers in the 18th century. The precision in these maps, particularly in terms of latitudinal and longitudinal readings, implies a level of cartographic sophistication that seems out of place in the historical timeline as we understand it. It's as if these mapmakers had tools and knowledge that history says they shouldn't have had. Graham Hancock's ideas about the loss and transmission of ancient knowledge are quite captivating, weaving together a narrative that stretches across time and civilizations. He proposes that a wealth of geographical knowledge, once possessed by an advanced ancient civilization, was largely lost due to cataclysmic events or perhaps the gradual decline of this civilization. It's a, it's a navigational device, it's, uh, it, it, it's a geared, cogged uh, mm. system that allows you to track the passage of time and figure out where you are. Again, that testifies to a lost navigational skill that, yes. we, that we have not taken account of. It's a thought-provoking idea, suggesting that what we know of our past might just be the tip of the iceberg. Hancock believes that some remnants of this knowledge managed to survive and eventually influenced the cartographic work of later civilizations, including those in the medieval and renaissance periods. Hancock delves into how this information could have been passed down. He suggests a variety of channels, including oral traditions, mythological texts, and even surviving cartographic materials, which later mapmakers like Piri Reis might have used. Imagine, for a moment, ancient mariners passing down stories of distant lands and seas, with these tales eventually finding their way into the maps and charts of later generations. One of the more intriguing aspects of Hancock's hypothesis is his connection with myths and legends from different cultures around the world. He often draws parallels between these stories and the idea of advanced prehistoric knowledge and global cataclysms, such as the Great Flood narratives found in many cultures, in Hancock's view, these myths and legends aren't just fanciful stories, they're potential historical records, allegorical but based on real events and knowledge from these lost civilizations. It's a narrative that challenges us to think beyond conventional historical accounts, suggesting that our ancestors might have known far more about the world than we give them credit for. You see, the, the, the one thing there's no dispute about anymore uh, is that the Younger Dryas was a cataclysm. The, 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 the megafauna that, uh, that, that die off, the disruption of human activity that takes place at that time, the huge climate changes, this was a cataclysm by any standards. Where the argument still goes on is what caused the, what caused the cataclysm. Graham Hancock has this really interesting, if somewhat controversial, hypothesis about a global cataclysm that he believes occurred around 10,600 BCE. He suggests that Earth was hit by a comet or a series of comet impacts at this time, leading to massive environmental and climatic upheavals worldwide. This idea is particularly interesting because he links it to the Younger Dryas period, a well-documented era of abrupt climate change that started around 12,900 years ago and lasted for about 1,300 years. The Younger Dryas is known for a sudden shift back to colder and drier conditions following a period of warming after the last ice age. Hancock posits that this comet impact could have been the trigger for this dramatic climatic shift. What's intriguing is how Hancock uses ice core samples from Greenland and Antarctica to support his theory. These ice cores, which provide a detailed record of past temperatures and atmospheric compositions, show evidence of a rapid climatic change during the Younger Dryas. He sees this as a smoking gun, indicating a major impact event. He also points to geological evidence like sediment layers that show signs of sudden environmental changes, further supporting his comet impact theory. We see all the megafauna dying off suddenly and rapidly. We see rises in sea level. We see a huge collapse in, in global temperature. What is becoming clearer and, and clearer uh, is that the evidence that a comet behind it was behind it is, is extremely strong. But Hancock doesn't stop there. He goes on to suggest that this hypothesized comet impact had profound effects on both flora and fauna, including contributing to the extinction of many large mammal species during what's known as the Pleistocene megafauna extinction. The changes in vegetation and ecosystems, he argues, would have had cascading effects on wildlife and human populations alike. 
For human societies, Hancock believes this event was catastrophic, causing significant disruptions and leading to the loss of advanced knowledge and cultural practices of prehistoric civilizations. It's like he's suggesting a kind of cultural amnesia, where societies forgot the advancements they had made. And then there's this fascinating idea that survivors of this cataclysm might have passed on fragments of their advanced knowledge to other cultures, influencing the development of future civilizations. It's a narrative that makes you wonder about the connections between ancient civilizations and how knowledge could have been transferred across generations and geographies in ways we might not fully understand. Homo sapiens line descends from a line that goes back about six million years, not much further than that, if we accept conventional evolutionary theory. So six million years ago, Antarctica is supposed to have been as cold and as frozen as it is today. And there's, no, there's undoubtedly a time, they found fossils on Antarctica, there's undoubtedly a time when, when Antarctica was, was lush and green. The question is, was it lush and green during the lifetime of the human species? Yes. Graham Hancock's theories about an ancient civilization in Antarctica are quite intriguing, although they veer significantly from mainstream scientific views. He speculates that a part of this lost advanced civilization was located in what's now the icy expanse of Antarctica. This is a striking thought considering Antarctica's current freezing conditions. He links this to the hypothesis of Earth crust displacement. The entire outer crust of the Earth, like the skin of an orange, might shift leaving the core of the Earth in place. This theory suggests that Antarctica wasn't always at the South Pole, but might have been in a more temperate region, allowing a civilization to thrive. However, it's crucial to note that this idea of Earth crust displacement isn't supported by the current scientific understanding of plate tectonics, which doesn't allow for such rapid and dramatic shifts of the Earth's crust. Hancock also delves into mythology, drawing connections between various global myths, legends, and religious texts. He interprets these as allegorical references to this lost civilization, particularly focusing on stories of great floods or cataclysms. He proposes that such a cataclysm, maybe a flood or a comet impact, led to the downfall of this advanced civilization. To me, the obvious answer is we are dealing with the fingerprints of a lost civilization that mapped the world and that left evidence of that mapping. According to his theory, survivors of this catastrophe might have traveled the world, spreading their advanced knowledge, significantly influencing the development of later civilizations like the Egyptians and Sumerians. One of the more fascinating aspects of his theory is how he points out the similarities in architectural structures and astronomical alignments at various ancient sites. He sees these as potential evidence of a shared origin of knowledge, suggesting that this knowledge could have been passed down from the earlier civilization. Hancock believes that this civilization's legacy includes not just advanced architectural techniques and astronomical observations, but potentially other lost technologies and wisdom. The date that Gobekli Tepe in Turkey is built, 11,600 years ago. <laughs> that, weirdly, is the date that Plato's Timaeus and Critias gives for the submergence of Atlantis. While his ideas certainly capture the imagination, it's important to remember that they are viewed with skepticism by the scientific community. Antarctica during the Eocene epoch was a completely different world from what we know today. It was actually positioned over the South Pole, just like it is now. But the climate back then was way warmer, allowing for a whole different kind of environment. This was a time when the continents were still shifting around after the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. So Antarctica, which was part of what we call Gondwana, was slowly moving to where it sits now, all isolated at the bottom of the world. This shifting around of continents, like Australia and South America moving away, played a big role in changing ocean currents and the climate. One of the most striking things about Antarctica back then was that it didn't have the massive ice sheet it has today. This absence of ice was mainly because of the much warmer global temperatures at the time. This had a big knock-on effect on the planet's climate, as the reflective ice that sends solar radiation back into space wasn't there, adding to the overall warmth. The tectonic movements during the Eocene were also pretty significant. The breakup of Gondwana was a major event reshaping the layout of the Earth's land and water. A key moment was the opening of the Drake Passage, the stretch of water between Antarctica and South America. This opening was a game-changer because it led to the creation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is a massive ocean current that goes around Antarctica. This current had a huge impact on the climate. 
It kind of put Antarctica in a climatic bubble circulating cold water around it and stopping the warmer waters from the north from getting through. This is believed to have played a big part in cooling down Antarctica and leading to the ice-covered continent we know today. As for what life was like back then, the fossil records are really fascinating. They show that Antarctica supported a diverse range of plants and even animals. We're talking about temperate to subtropical forests with beaches, conifers and ferns. Imagine that in place of today's icy desert. These fossils tell us the climate was much warmer and humid. And then there's the sea level, which was way higher than what we see now because there weren't those big ice caps locking up all that water. So this is how, how do you know that sea level rose? There are certain corals that can only exist within a certain number of feet of the, of the sea's surface. This meant that the coastline and the shape of the land were quite different. And some places that are land now were underwater back then. The warmer temperatures and higher sea levels would have made the marine life around Antarctica rich and diverse, very different from what's there now. The Eocene epoch, which lasted from about 56 to 34 million years ago, was a really interesting time in Earth's history. It was part of this bigger period called the Paleogene period, and it's a part of what scientists call the Cenozoic era. This era is often nicknamed the Age of Mammals because it's when mammals started to diversify a lot especially after the dinosaurs had their big exit at the end of the Cretaceous period. During the Eocene, the world's continents were on the move, drifting towards where they are now. This movement was a big deal because it changed how ocean currents flowed and affected the climate in a bunch of ways. Now, one of the most dramatic things about the Eocene was this event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. This happened around 56 million years ago, and it was a time when the Earth got really warm, really fast. Temperatures shot up by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius in just a few thousand years. Scientists think this might have been because of a ton of methane being released from the ocean floor. This warming had a huge impact on life on Earth. In the oceans, some species went extinct, while on land mammals started to evolve and diversify like crazy. The levels of CO2 in the atmosphere were also way higher than what we have today. Estimates say it was between 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million, which is a lot compared to the pre-industrial level of about 280 ppm. This high level of CO2 came from things like volcanic activity, burning of organic matter, and because natural carbon sinks weren't as effective, one of the big differences between the Eocene and now was that there were no major ice sheets at the poles. This is really different from today, where we've got big ice caps in both the Arctic and Antarctic. Because the Earth was so much warmer, the temperature difference between the equator and the poles wasn't as extreme as it is now. As a result, the polar regions were much warmer than they are today. And because there was less ice, sea levels were higher. This means a lot of water that's currently frozen in ice was in the ocean back then. This affected marine life a lot, changing where different species lived and leading to the development of new types of marine ecosystems. One of the things I find most striking is the presence of Antarctica on ancient maps, because we didn't discover it until 1820. Now, Graham has a really fascinating theory about an ancient advanced civilization that he believes existed long before the civilizations we commonly recognize, like the Sumerians of Mesopotamia. His idea pushes the timeline of advanced human societies back tens of thousands of years, possibly even to the last ice age, this is a huge leap from the established historical understanding, which generally sees complex societies and civilizations emerging more recently. Hancock points to the incredible architectural feats of ancient megalithic structures, like those at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, Stonehenge in England, and various sites in Egypt and Mesoamerica. He sees these as evidence of a highly advanced architectural knowledge. Moreover, he talks about the astronomical precision of these structures, for instance, how the Great Pyramids of Giza align with the stars of Orion's belt, or how Stonehenge aligns with the solstices and equinoxes. These aren't just random placements, they suggest a deep understanding of the stars and seasons. He also believes this civilization had impressive navigational skills, which might explain how similar architectural and astronomical concepts appeared across different continents. But it's not just about the buildings and their alignments with celestial events. Hancock thinks these ancient monuments reflect a comprehensive knowledge of astronomy that was integrated into the culture and religious practices of the time. He also suggests evidence of sophisticated urban planning in ancient ruins, indicating a level of societal organization and city-building knowledge that's not typically credited to prehistoric societies. 
Then there's the idea of a global spread of knowledge. Hancock theorizes that the similarities in architectural styles and astronomical knowledge across various ancient cultures around the world point to a common, advanced source of knowledge. This knowledge could have been spread by the survivors of this ancient society. Graham Hancock's theory really takes a global perspective when it comes to the influence of this ancient, advanced civilization he proposes. He thinks that this civilization had a major impact all over the world. It's not just a localized phenomenon, but something that reached across continents. According to him, we can see traces of this civilization in the myths, architectural designs, and astronomical knowledge of many different ancient cultures. He's suggesting that there's a kind of cultural diffusion that took place from this lost civilization to later societies. So when we see similar styles in buildings or common themes in religious beliefs and astronomical practices across various ancient cultures, he interprets this as evidence of their influence. He goes further to speculate that after some huge disaster that brought this civilization down, the survivors might have spread out to different areas of the world. These survivors, he believes, were the ones who passed on their advanced knowledge and this played a crucial role in the development of the civilizations we know about from history, like the Egyptians and Sumerians. Now, when it comes to evidence, Hancock looks at archaeological sites and findings that he feels mainstream archaeology hasn't been able to fully explain. He talks about structures that, to him, seem like they needed pretty advanced engineering or astronomical know-how to build. He also dives into ancient texts and myths, interpreting them not just as stories or legends, but as allegorical records of real historical events. Think of tales about great floods or lost lands like Atlantis. Hancock sees these as collective memories of the lost civilization. He also notes that there are these cross-cultural similarities, like how myths from different parts of the world seem to share common themes, or how architectural styles and astronomical knowledge seem to echo each other even across cultures that supposedly never interacted. To Hancock, this points to a shared older source of knowledge. It was held that the Neanderthals were stupid, primitive subhumans, shambling, lacking symbolism. Turns out that that's not true at all. And what first drew me into it was uh, Denisova Cave mm -hmm. uh, in Siberia. What they discover is, this isn't a Neanderthal, this is another human species. The Denisova cave, nestled in the Bashalaksky range of the Altai Mountains, holds a special place in the world of archaeology and human evolution studies. This remarkable site, located at the convergence of Russia, China, Mongolia and Kazakhstan, is renowned for its rugged terrain and rich biodiversity. The Altai Mountains, a region with a complex geological history, are home to diverse flora and fauna and numerous caves, including the Denisova Cave. Denisova Cave is a fascinating, beautiful place to visit. It's another, it's another example of a missing chapter in the human story that is beginning to be pieced together. Interestingly, the cave was initially explored in the 1970s by Soviet scientists who were more focused on geology and paleontology. At that time, the archaeological significance of the cave wasn't fully recognized. It was named after Denis, a hermit who lived there in the 18th century, adding a layer of cultural history to the site. The cave itself comprises several chambers and galleries, which have revealed signs of long-term habitation by various groups, including ancient hominins. The turning point in understanding the cave's importance came with the discovery of a Denisovan finger bone in 2008. This discovery catapulted the Denisova cave into the limelight of international scientific research. Excavations since then have unveiled a rich stratigraphy, replete with artifacts and hominin remains, showing that the cave was a hub of activity over tens of thousands of years. What makes this cave even more fascinating is its remote location and the challenging climatic conditions of the Altai Mountains, which add a layer of complexity to archaeological expeditions. Researchers from around the world have been drawn to this site, striving to uncover its secrets. The genome of the Denisovans and revealed the Denisovan connection to, to anatomically modern humans. The story of the Denisovans is a truly fascinating one, revealing a complex and intriguing chapter in our prehistoric past. This group of extinct archaic humans came into the spotlight in 2010 with a remarkable discovery in the Denisova cave in Siberia. Initially, scientists thought they had found a Neanderthal bone, but DNA analysis told a different story. It was a finger bone fragment, but not from a Neanderthal. 
Instead, it unveiled a distinct genetic profile, marking the identification of an entirely new group of ancient humans, the Denisovans. Genetically, the Denisovans were unique, distinct both from modern humans and Neanderthals. The DNA suggested a divergence from Neanderthals around 400,000 years ago, a detail that has added depth to our understanding of human evolution during the Pleistocene era. But the physical appearance of the Denisovans is still largely a mystery. We have only a finger bone, a few teeth, and a fragment of a skull. These limited fossils, robust in nature, hint that the Denisovans were well adapted to the harsh environments of Pleistocene Asia, possibly physically formidable. What's truly remarkable is the Denisovans' genetic legacy in modern humans. Certain populations, particularly in Asia and Oceania, carry Denisovan DNA, a testament to ancient interbreeding. Denisovan DNA survives, interestingly enough, it survives uh, predominantly in Australasia, uh, in Papua New Guinea and amongst uh, Aust Australian Aborigines. The indigenous populations in Melanesia, like the Papua New Guineans, show the highest known Denisovan ancestry. About 5% of their DNA is Denisovan. This interbreeding wasn't just with modern humans, they also mingled with Neanderthals, showing a pattern of intermixing among different archaic human species that was more common than we previously thought. And the Denisovans might not have just mingled with known species. Recent studies suggest they might have interbred with another, yet unidentified, ancient human lineage. But what about their culture? While direct evidence is scarce, the Denisova cave has yielded sophisticated stone tools, a bone needle and jewellery. There are indications of strangely out-of-place technology amongst the Denisovans, which is 20, 30,000 years earlier in the human story than it, than it should be. The impact of the Denisovans on evolutionary biology has been nothing short of revolutionary. They've reshaped our understanding of human evolution, showing us a more intricate history than we once understood. They've also opened up new questions about migration, adaptation and survival of archaic human populations in Eurasia, but there's still so much we don't know. Research into the Denisovans is ongoing, with scientists piecing together more information from the limited material available. The Denisovan genome in particular is a gold mine. Now moving on to other unsolved mysteries and events in the frigid lands of Siberia, the Tunguska event of 1908 is a story that sounds like it's straight out of a science fiction novel, but it's all real and incredibly intriguing. On June 30th, 1908, something extraordinary happened near the Podkamanaya Tunguska River in central Siberia. An explosion so massive that it flattened about 80 million trees over 2,150 square kilometers occurred. Just to put it in perspective, this blast was about 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The shockwave was so immense that it was felt up to 2,000 kilometers away. Eyewitnesses described a bright blue light, almost as bright as the sun, and a series of explosions that were followed by a shockwave that knocked people off their feet and broke windows hundreds of kilometers away. The first scientific investigation was conducted by Leonid Kulik, a Russian mineralogist in 1927. Kulik expected to find a meteorite crater at the site, but instead found a large area of flattened trees radiating outward from a central point with no apparent crater. The leading theory suggests that a small asteroid or comet fragment exploded in the Earth's atmosphere, about 5 to 10 kilometers high, releasing energy equivalent to 10, 15 megatons of TNT. The region of Tunguska sees the biggest explosion in human history. In one hour, the explosion and the great fire that followed destroy a region of forest the size of Greater London. But there are other theories too. Some scientists think it could have been a natural gas leak from within the Earth that ignited in the atmosphere. There are even more exotic theories like antimatter or a miniature black hole colliding with Earth. The environmental impact of this explosion was significant. It led to increased rates of tree growth in the affected area and reports of genetic mutations in plants and animals, possibly due to the intense heat and shockwave. Moreover, the event had global atmospheric repercussions, contributing to the formation of noctilucent clouds and a decrease in atmospheric transparency observed in Europe and Asia. But with all great mysteries come numerous conspiracy theories and speculations. The Tunguska event is no exception. Its mysterious nature has fueled theories about extraterrestrial involvement and secret weapons tests. 
Despite all the research and theories, the Tunguska event remains one of the 20th century's greatest unsolved mysteries. The Valley of Death in Siberia's Yakutia region is a place that's as mysterious as its name suggests. It's nestled in the northeastern part of Siberia, in the Saka Republic, known for its extreme climate swings, from scorching summers to winters that are brutally cold. But what really draws attention to this place are the unusual metallic structures scattered throughout the area. These structures are shrouded in mystery, with descriptions varying from dome-like formations to metal objects that are partially buried in the earth. Their origins and compositions are still a puzzle waiting to be solved. Access to the Valley of Death is quite a challenge due to its remote location and harsh climate. The area is mostly accessible only during certain seasons, which makes exploration and research quite difficult. And then there's the local folklore. The Yakut people have long spoken of this valley and its mysterious structures, often associating them with danger and mystique. There are tales suggesting that these structures might be ancient artifacts with unknown powers or energies. Some even say that people and animals have suffered ill effects, like illness or even death after getting too close to these structures. While these stories are compelling, they are after all part of local lore and lack scientific verification. But scientists have their theories too. One of them suggests that these structures could be remnants of meteorite impacts, especially considering Siberia's history with events like the Tunguska explosion. These could be unusually large or unique meteoritic fragments. Another theory points towards the possibility of these structures being ancient man-made artifacts, perhaps linked to early human inhabitants or an unknown civilization that once dwelled in prehistoric Siberia. However, exploring this area is no small feat, the extreme weather conditions coupled with the region's remoteness pose significant challenges. Winter temperatures often plummet below minus 50 degrees Celsius, and summers bring their own challenges like flooding and swarms of insects. The lack of infrastructure and limited access to the region further complicates sustained scientific research. This has resulted in limited empirical data about these structures. It's obvious now that we were not alone, that there were multiple other human species who were human enough to interbreed with us and leave, uh, leave DNA. The mystery surrounding it extends beyond science, attracting historians, paranormal enthusiasts and even tourists. Its secret nature fuels speculation and interest in Siberia's ancient past and unexplored territories. As exploration and technology advance, it's possible that we might unravel more secrets of this mysterious valley. The Amazon Basin is 7 million square kilometers in area. And within it, 5.5 million square kilometers remains almost entirely unstudied by archaeologists. We've done world archaeology, but we've just ignored the Amazon. What we find in the Amazon are thousands of henges that are now beginning to emerge from the cleared area of the jungle and others that have been identified for the first time with LIDAR. Discoveries of ancient civilizations in the Amazon jungle have unveiled a complex and sophisticated history that challenges previous assumptions about the region. These discoveries, made through a combination of aerial surveys, satellite imagery, and ground expeditions, reveal the existence of large, well-planned urban settlements, extensive road networks, and advanced agricultural techniques suggesting a much higher level of social organization and environmental management than previously thought. The Kuhikugu complex in the upper Xingu region of the Brazilian Amazon offers an incredible glimpse into the advanced urban planning and societal organization of pre-Columbian civilizations long before European contact. Nestled in the remote Amazon basin in present-day Mato Grosso, Brazil, this area is a treasure trove of biodiversity. The dense rainforests and network of rivers likely played a key role in the development and sustenance of this complex society. Covering about 50 square kilometers, the Kuhikugu complex is home to over 20 settlements. These aren't just randomly placed, they're strategically positioned to make the most of the region's natural resources. What's fascinating is how these settlements are connected. Imagine a series of straight roads, some stretching for several kilometers, laid out with such precision that they often align with the cardinal directions. This not only facilitated travel, but also shows a high level of planning and coordination. Then there's the canal system, an impressive display of hydraulic engineering, likely used for everything from transportation to water management, and maybe even fish farming. The variety of structures within the complex is equally remarkable. 
From large public buildings and ceremonial spaces to individual homes, the architecture reflects a hierarchy in building techniques, hinting at different social or functional roles within the society. And speaking of society, estimates suggest that at its peak, Kuhikugu could have supported a whopping 30,000 to 50,000 people. This is deduced from the sheer number of residential structures and the expanse of agricultural land along the Amazon. He reported seeing incredible cities, advanced arts and crafts, millions of people, a thriving culture. Uh, the rediscovery of the Kuhikugu complex in the Amazon is a fascinating story that blends modern technology with traditional archaeology. Initially, this hidden gem was revealed through aerial surveys and satellite images. Imagine flying over the dense Amazon rainforest and suddenly spotting the outlines of an ancient civilization. Then, archaeologists like Michael Heckenberger and his team took over, conducting extensive ground excavations. They employed advanced techniques like LIDAR, which is like X-ray vision for archaeologists, to see through the forest canopy and map the area accurately. Now let's talk about how old this place is. Using carbon dating, a method to tell the age of artifacts and soil, scientists figured out that people lived in the Kuhikugu complex for several centuries, dating back to as early as 800 AD. They found all sorts of things like pottery, stone tools and ornaments, giving us a glimpse into the daily life and creativity of the people who lived there. Here's the kicker. Before finding Kuhikugu, many thought the Amazon was mostly an untouched wilderness before Europeans arrived. But this discovery turned that idea on its head, showing that the area was home to a large and complex society. It's like finding a hidden chapter of history in your backyard. This place shows us that humans had a big impact on the Amazon, way earlier than we thought. They even made their own super-fertile soil called Terra Preta, which is still rich and productive today. What's really cool about Kuhikugu is how it shows that the people there knew how to live sustainably. They had advanced farming practices, managed water well, and lived in harmony with their environment. It's like they were eco-friendly before it was trendy. This discovery also made us rethink the role of indigenous societies in the Amazon. It turns out they knew a lot about how to manage the land and shape the landscape. It's a reminder of how important it is to value and learn from indigenous knowledge. And lastly, the biodiversity in the Amazon today might partly be thanks to these ancient civilizations. The variety of plants near these archaeological sites is way more than in other areas of the forest. The Amazon is basically a garden. The Amazon is a man-made rainforest. Uh, there are certain trees like Brazil nut trees or the ice cream bean tree, which are food crops, which are very, very valuable. Marajo Island at the Amazon River's mouth is like a time capsule that takes us back to the Marajoara culture, a sophisticated civilization from around 800 to 1400 CE. Imagine an island almost as big as Switzerland, right at the meeting point of a river and the ocean. This place, with its mix of forests, savannas and wetlands, is not just big but also incredibly diverse. It's the perfect backdrop for the Marahuara people to thrive, providing everything from food to resources for their unique lifestyle. Now, the Marahuara culture is something special. They were known for their artistic flair, especially their ceramics. Picture pots and plates with intricate designs, complex patterns and images of animals and people. They weren't just making these for fun. Their ceramics were a big part of their culture and beliefs, like the large, beautifully decorated urns they used for burials. These suggest they had quite complex ideas about life, death, and everything in between. But it's not just their art that's fascinating. They built these massive earthen mounds, some over 10 meters high. Think about that. That's like stacking three buses on top of each other. These mounds were probably used for everything from homes to ceremonial sites and might have even protected them from the frequent floods. This shows they were pretty savvy engineers and architects, adapting to their challenging environment in style. The way they organized their society was also quite something. It seems there was a clear hierarchy, with some people leading the way in managing resources and religious practices. And they had different roles for men and women which we can figure out from the things they left behind. Now let's talk about their farming skills. They were ahead of their time, creating raised fields to keep their crops safe from flooding. Their diet was a mix of what they grew, along with fish and game from the surrounding area. And they were smart about managing water with their canals and ditches, which was pretty crucial in a place that floods a lot. Santa Rem, right where the Tapajos meets the Amazon River, 
is a fascinating place, especially when you think about its history. This spot was like the Grand Central Station of its time, bustling with trade and culture. Picture boats coming in and out, carrying all sorts of goods and ideas from different parts of South America. The area around Santa Rem was rich in resources, which helped the settlement thrive. Now the people of Santa Rem were known for their incredible pottery. We're talking about really intricate designs here, geometric patterns, pictures of people and animals, and even mythical beings. The level of detail in these pots and plates is just mind-blowing. And it wasn't just about looking good. These designs tell us a lot about their culture and beliefs. The way they made this pottery was pretty advanced too. They had techniques for molding, firing and painting that were way ahead of their time. The variety of colors and the way they used glazes show they really knew their stuff when it came to chemistry and kiln construction. It's like they were the master chefs of pottery, knowing exactly how to cook up the perfect piece. Santa Rem was more than just a local market. It was a cultural hub. The different styles and motifs in the pottery suggest they were mixing it up with all sorts of cultures. And it wasn't just goods they were trading. They were probably swapping stories, ideas and practices too. The town itself, from what we can tell from the ruins, was pretty well organized. They had different areas for living, working, and probably for community gatherings or ceremonies. It's like they had their own little urban planning going on. But back to the pottery, it's not just about how it was made, but what it tells us about the people of Santa Rem. It gives us a peek into their daily lives, what they valued, and how they connected with others. The geoglyphs in the Amazon, especially in the Brazilian states of Acre and Rondonia, are like a secret world that's been hidden under the dense forest canopy for centuries. It wasn't until the late 20th and early 21st centuries, mostly because of deforestation, that these incredible earthworks started to come to light, thanks to technology like satellite imagery and LIDAR, which is basically like having X-ray vision from space. Over 450 of these geoglyphs have been mapped. This discovery has completely changed our view of how people lived in the Amazon before Columbus. Now these aren't just a few lines in the dirt. We're talking about huge designs that can stretch over a kilometer and cover several square kilometers. They come in all sorts of shapes, circles, squares, rectangles, and more intricate forms. Some even have patterns like radial spokes which add to their complexity. The sheer size of these geoglyphs hints at a society that was really well organized and could bring together a lot of people to create these massive works. But how did they make them? Well, they would remove the top layer of soil and vegetation, revealing the lighter colored earth underneath. This contrast made the design stand out when viewed from above. It seems like they used a variety of tools made from materials like stone, bone and wood. The level of precision in these geoglyphs shows they were not only skilled, but also had serious planning chops. Some of these geoglyphs line up with astronomical events, like the solstices and equinoxes. This suggests they might have been used for tracking celestial events or for ceremonial or religious purposes. Imagine large groups of people gathering at these geoglyphs for festivals or rituals. It must have been quite a sight. But here's the really cool part. These geoglyphs tell us that the societies in the Amazon before Europeans arrived were much more complex than we thought. They could modify their environment on a large scale and had a social structure where leaders could organize big projects. And despite the size of these geoglyphs, they were made in a way that respected and integrated with the surrounding landscape. So discovering these geoglyphs has really turned our understanding of the Amazon's history on its head. It's no longer seen as just a vast, untouched wilderness, but as a place where complex, organized societies lived and actively shaped their world. But before the Aztecs and before the Maya, there were a culture who are referred to as the Olmecs. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've, you know, than we than we've realized. And and what the what the DNA is doing is uh, it's telling us that there was something really weird, 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 weird. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a growing fascination with ancient civilizations, particularly in the Victorian era. This interest was driven by a mix of cultural trends in exploration, colonization, and a certain romantic allure attached to discovering lost cultures. Major institutions like museums and universities, primarily in Europe and the US, started funding expeditions to unearth ancient artifacts and understand the history of indigenous civilizations in the Americas. 
It was a time when archaeology began to evolve from just hunting for treasures to a more scientific approach, focusing on careful excavation and detailed analysis. One of the things I've realized is that there is no classic Native American feature, that, that Na Native Americans are, uh, a very, have a very complex genetic story with very many different elements uh, br brought into it, and we shouldn't be necessarily surprised by the supposedly non-Native American look. Interestingly, during this period, many artifacts, especially the colossal heads and stone structures found in the Olmec region, were often wrongly attributed to other well-known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec. This was largely because the unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography weren't immediately recognized, partly due to a lack of an overall framework to understand the region's history before Columbus. A couple of notable explorers, John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, played a significant role in stirring up interest in Mesoamerican cultures with their explorations and writings, particularly their books on travels in Central America and Yucatan. Their detailed accounts and illustrations captured the public's imagination, sparking a wave of interest in these ancient cultures. While they mainly focused on the Maya, their approach to systematically document their findings and blend travel narratives with scholarly observations greatly influenced future archaeologists studying Mesoamerica. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil, uh, which appear to show uh, very strongly Polynesian or African features, very much like the features that we see mm. on, the, on the Olmec heads. Around this time, there was also a trend in comparative archaeology, where discoveries from different parts of the world were compared, helping to place Mesoamerican civilizations in a global context. Museums began to transition from just storing artifacts to becoming centers of research and education, playing a crucial role in spreading knowledge about ancient cultures. This era also marked the start of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, integrating fields like anthropology, linguistics, and early forms of environmental science. This broader, more inclusive approach helped in piecing together a more comprehensive understanding of ancient civilizations, including the intriguing and complex Olmec culture. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when Western archaeologists were exploring Mesoamerica, they started coming across these massive stone heads. Some of them were over nine feet tall and weighed several tons, with distinctive features like flat noses and fleshy cheeks, often adorned with helmet-like headgear. But here's the thing. Despite their impressive size and unique features, their true cultural significance wasn't immediately understood they're most famous for is these huge carved human heads uh, which can be on a scale of up to 20 to 25 tons which have curious features which have been interpreted variously as Polynesian, African, don't look like classic uh, Native American features. One of the earliest significant findings was made by Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862 at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. He unearthed what we now know as one of the first Olmec colossal heads. Melgari Serrano even described the head as having Ethiopian features, which tells us a lot about the perceptions and biases of that era. But, and this is crucial, his discovery didn't really spark a broader understanding of the Olmec culture right away. For a long time, these heads were seen more as intriguing oddities rather than pieces of a larger cultural puzzle. It took several decades and a lot more digging before the significance of these heads truly began to be appreciated. Initially, many people thought these artifacts might belong to other known civilizations, like the Maya or Aztec, because the idea of the Olmecs being a distinct early Mesoamerican civilization hadn't quite taken shape yet. It wasn't until the mid-20th century, with more systematic excavations led by archaeologists like Matthew Sterling, that the true picture began to emerge. They found more colossal heads and other artifacts, and this really helped to establish the Olmecs as a significant and influential civilization in their own right, predating and possibly even influencing others like the Maya and the Aztecs. Back in 1945, a really important expedition took place, led by this guy named Matthew Sterling. He and his team headed to San Lorenzo, right in the heart of what was once Olmec territory. This wasn't just any random adventure, it was a big deal because the Smithsonian Institution was backing it. They saw the potential in figuring out more about the Olmec sites, which could really shed some light on Mesoamerican prehistory. Before Sterling got there, there had been some poking around in the area. 
mostly because people kept finding these huge stone heads. These finds were intriguing but didn't quite give the full picture. So enter Sterling. He was already pretty well known in archaeology circles and had a real knack for Mesoamerican cultures. He was the perfect guy to take on such a complex task. Now, it wasn't an easy job. The San Lorenzo site was in this tropical area, covered in thick jungle. Just getting to the site and starting to dig was a huge challenge. They had to clear a bunch of jungle without messing up any artifacts that might be hiding there. And let me tell you, the weather didn't make things any easier. It was humid, unpredictable and not the best for keeping ancient artifacts in one piece. The site itself was huge, spreading out over several kilometers. Sterling and his team had to figure out where to start digging because there was no way they could cover the whole area. They did an initial survey which took a lot of time and planning and then decided on the most promising spots to start excavating. They had to be super careful with how they dug things up. The artifacts were old and fragile, especially with the humidity. Plus, they had to keep track of everything they found, where they found it, and all the details, which was crucial for understanding the site later on. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. What they found at San Lorenzo was amazing. It turned out to be one of the oldest big cities in Mesoamerica, dating way back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's even before civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs that most people are familiar with. The artifacts they unearthed, especially those massive stone heads, were a big deal. They were carved from single blocks of basalt and had all these unique facial features. It was clear that the people who made them were incredibly skilled. All this hard work at San Lorenzo really helped piece together the story of the Olmecs. It gave us a clearer timeline and showed just how complex and advanced their society was. Diving deeper into San Lorenzo, which is super important when it comes to understanding the Olmec civilization, it's considered the oldest major city in Mesoamerica, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's way before other famous civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. Radiocarbon dating was key here. It helped archaeologists nail down the timeline of the site, giving a much clearer picture of when the Olmecs were doing their thing. Now, the most famous stuff they found at San Lorenzo definitely the colossal heads. These huge sculptures were carved from single basalt blocks and are known for their unique facial features like almond-shaped eyes and broad noses. A lot of them have these intricate headdresses too, which might have been a sign of high status or had some ceremonial purpose, but there's still a lot of debate about what all the symbols mean. The size of these heads is just mind-blowing. Some are up to three meters high and weigh around 50 tons. Imagine the skill it took to carve those. But it wasn't just the heads. They found jade figurines and a bunch of different pottery styles, which tell us a lot about their daily life, art, and even trade. The jade stuff suggests they had trade networks because jade wasn't just lying around everywhere. And the buildings. They found large structures like platforms and what might have been houses for the elite. This points to a society that was really well organized and had the resources to build big. The way San Lorenzo was laid out is also fascinating. It had a central axis, which indicates that the city was carefully planned. There were separate areas for ceremonies and living, showing a sophisticated urban structure and hinting at a social hierarchy. All this stuff from San Lorenzo has been super important for understanding the Olmecs. It's given us a much clearer timeline of their civilization and shown just how complex their society was. The variety in the artifacts, from the colossal heads to the pottery, shows that they were not only skilled in stone carving, but had artists and craftsmen who were really good at what they did. It's like San Lorenzo has given us a window into a past world, showing us how these ancient people lived, worked, and created. After the exciting discoveries at San Lorenzo in the 1940s, archaeologists turned their attention to La Venta, another key Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, in the 1950s. This shift was a big deal because La Venta offered a new window into the Olmec world. Known as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica, the explorations here were more focused and methodical, thanks to archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser. These guys weren't just digging around, they brought in techniques from other fields like anthropology and geology, giving a fuller picture of the Olmec civilization. La Venta is super important for understanding the peak of Olmec culture. The site was in its prime from around 900 to 400 BCE, a time when the Olmecs were really showing off their artistic and architectural skills. One of the standout features of La Venta is the Great Pyramid, 
It's not like the pyramids in Egypt. This one's made of earth and clay and has a unique conical shape. It was one of the biggest structures in ancient Mesoamerica at the time, which tells us the Olmecs were pretty good at organizing big construction projects. The pyramid was probably more than just a big building. It's believed to have been a key spot for ceremonies or religious activities, kind of like the heart of Olmec ritual life, the way they built it and other structures at La Venta, and how they aligned them with astronomical bodies shows they were pretty savvy with engineering and astronomy. It was likely a bustling cultural hub where significant ceremonies and gatherings happened. When archaeologists started digging at La Venta, they did things a bit differently than before. They were super systematic about it, focusing on layers of soil and the context of each artifact they found. But they had their work cut out for them. The tropical climate and the fact that many Olmec structures were made of earth really made preserving and understanding these finds tough. They had to be meticulous in recording everything they dug up, which has been a goldmine for future analysis. Now just like at San Lorenzo, La Venta is famous for its massive basalt heads. Carved from huge boulders, these heads are thought to be representations of Olmec rulers or other big shots in their society. But there's more. The site is full of altars with intricate carvings showing people, animals and all sorts of symbolic scenes. It's like getting a glimpse into their mythology and rituals. And then there's the jade. Leventa turned up loads of jade artifacts from beautifully carved figurines to Celts. These weren't just pretty things to look at. They showed how skilled the Olmecs were and hinted at long trade networks since jade wasn't just lying around nearby. But here's where it gets really interesting. The burial sites they found were complex, with all kinds of elaborate practices. They also found mosaic pavements made of serpentine and various offerings, which likely had deep religious meaning. All this stuff from La Venta has been super important in piecing together who the Olmecs were, their social structure, religious beliefs, and artistic talents. However, keeping La Venta in good shape for future studies is a challenge, the sites battling both natural elements and human factors. So, preserving this amazing place is crucial, not just for archaeology buffs, but for understanding a key part of human history. But what's fascinating about them is they are, they are supposedly the first high civilization of Central America. That they create structures on a massive scale, that you can see connections between them and the later, the later Maya. For the Maya, the Milky Way was a particularly important feature of the heavens. They conceived of it as the road that led to their netherworld, Zibalba. In the verdant lands of Central America, the ancient Maya civilization flourished with a mysterious brilliance that continues to captivate the world. Among the many enigmas they left behind, their profound understanding of astronomy stands as a testament to their intellectual prowess. Graham Hancock, a modern explorer of ancient mysteries, delves deep into this aspect of the Maya, proposing intriguing theories that stretch the bounds of conventional history. That whole mystery of the Mayan calendar was clearly inherited from the Olmecs. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. The Maya Long Count Calendar, a marvel of ancient engineering, intricately tracked a 5,125-year cycle with astonishing precision. This calendar wasn't just a tool for marking time. It was a complex understanding of celestial cycles, intertwining the Maya's daily lives with the cosmos. Hancock suggests that this precision hints at a deeper, possibly inherited, knowledge of astronomy. Was this sophisticated understanding a legacy from a much older, now lost civilization? When one looks at the grandeur of Maya structures such as the pyramid at Chichen Itza, the brilliance of their astronomical alignment is striking. During the equinoxes, the play of light and shadow on this pyramid creates the illusion of a serpent slithering down its steps. To Hancock, these architectural marvels are not just buildings, but celestial maps, echoing an advanced understanding of the cosmos. Orion was extensively involved in Mayan rebirth beliefs, which described the constellation and specifically its three belt stars as the turtle of rebirth. In Egypt, as amongst the Maya, the stellar context involves Orion and the Milky Way. The Maya's awareness of the ecliptic, the path followed by the sun, moon, and planets across the sky, further fuels Hancock's theories. Their ability to predict solar and lunar eclipses and track the movements of Venus, which they revered as the god Kukulkan, showcases their deep astronomical knowledge. Did they learn this from an older civilization? Hancock wonders. 
a civilization lost in the depths of time. Hancock theorizes that the Maya might have been part of a vast network of ancient civilizations, sharing knowledge across seas and continents. This global maritime culture, as he envisages, could have been a conduit for transferring advanced astronomical and architectural knowledge to the Maya. The architectural designs of the Maya, seen in their pyramids, temples, and cities, reflect a level of technological and engineering skill that seems almost ahead of their time. Were these skills handed down from a previous, more advanced civilization? The mathematical systems of the Maya, including their use of zero, a concept rare in the ancient world, were integral to their astronomical calculations. Hancock proposes that this mathematical sophistication, too, might be a legacy from a forgotten civilization. We're not what it's all about at all. Uh, that there may have been an earlier civilization that reached a high level of advancement, perhaps different from ours, but nevertheless an advanced civilization, which was just taken out of the story completely by a global cataclysm. In a tale woven from the threads of ancient mysteries, Graham Hancock, a modern-day seeker of lost truths, presents a fascinating theory. He imagines a world where an advanced civilization, predating the ancient cultures known to history, once thrived. This civilization, possibly flourishing before the last ice age ended around 10,000 BCE, was a beacon of knowledge in fields like astronomy, architecture, and mathematics. Hancock's story tells of a society whose influence stretched far beyond its own time and space, touching various corners of the ancient world, including the enigmatic Maya civilization. I think, and it's my case, that it wiped our memory of a previous episode of, of human civilization, that right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. However, this ancient global society in Hancock's story faced a dramatic and catastrophic end. He hypothesizes that a cataclysmic event, such as a comet impact or a massive flood, nearly obliterated this civilization. But not all was lost. The survivors, carrying the torch of their advanced knowledge, ventured out into the world. These bearers of ancient wisdom found their way to other, less advanced societies and shared their knowledge, planting the seeds for new civilizations to grow. Among these were the Maya, who, in Hancock's view, may have been one of the many inheritors of this ancient legacy. Hancock points to the Maya's remarkable architectural and astronomical achievements as evidence of this influence. The precision of their calendar systems, their understanding of celestial cycles, and the alignment of their buildings with astronomical events are, in his narrative, not just the fruits of their own ingenuity, but possibly a heritage from a civilization lost in the mists of time. He draws parallels between the architectural styles, religious beliefs, and astronomical knowledge found across various ancient cultures, suggesting these similarities might be remnants of a shared source of ancient wisdom. Because we now know that at that time, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, truly global cataclysmic events involving rapid rises in sea level yeah. uh, did occur, and suddenly the, the worldwide tradition of a, of a global flood stops being just a myth and starts being a memory. In a narrative that intertwines the mysteries of ancient seas with the Maya calendar, Graham Hancock, a storyteller of history's hidden chapters, brings to life his theories of a bygone era. He paints a picture of an ancient world, not fragmented by vast oceans, but connected through them. This world, according to Hancock, was home to a sophisticated global maritime culture. This culture, adept in the art of navigation and shipbuilding, embarked on extensive sea voyages, knitting together the far-flung civilizations of the ancient world. Hancock's tale is not just about the movement of ships, but also about the flow of ideas, technologies, and beliefs. He sees the similarities in architectural styles and construction techniques across different ancient cultures as whispers of a shared knowledge, possibly disseminated through this maritime network. In this story, ancient seafarers are the unsung heroes, ferrying not just goods, but also the seeds of culture and religion across the world's watery expanse. He draws parallels with the Polynesian navigators, known for their remarkable oceanic voyages, 
suggesting that similar capabilities could have existed among these ancient maritime cultures. They're telling us that uh, this lost civilization was submerged in a great flood around 11,600 years before our time. This is why I think we need to pay attention to the Atlantis story rather than just write it off as the ravings of the lunatic fringe. But Hancock's narrative takes an intriguing turn as he touches upon the mysterious Maya civilization and their long count calendar. This calendar, a sophisticated timekeeping system, tracks a cycle of approximately 5,125 years, culminating in a date that modern calendars align with December 21st, 2012. Hancock, weaving a tale from the threads of time, views this not as an apocalyptic end, but as a significant moment in Maya cosmology, a marker of major transition or transformation. In this story, the 2012 phenomenon is not a tale of doom, but a moment of cosmological significance, possibly indicating a shift in human consciousness or the dawn of a new era in human history. Hancock uses this moment to discuss the broader concept of historical cycles, how ancient civilizations understood and measured time, and their alignment with astronomical events such as the precession of the equinoxes and the galaxy's alignment. Graham Hancock, a modern-day chronicler of lost civilizations, presents a captivating theory. He tells a story of Earth's history punctuated by cataclysmic events, asteroid impacts, massive floods, and volcanic eruptions that have periodically reshaped the course of human civilization. In this tale, these cataclysms are not just natural disasters, but pivotal moments that lead to the rise and fall of civilizations, causing a reset of human progress. The people in Egypt, they believed in what's called Kemet, the people that existed before the Egyptians. When we hear these stories about the Great Pyramid being a tomb for the Pharaoh, it's worth mentioning that even the locals didn't believe that. Once upon a time, as the last ice age retreated and the earth began a dramatic transformation, the stage was set for a narrative that would challenge our understanding of human history. This was a time of global climatic shifts, marked by rising temperatures, melting ice and rising sea levels. Human societies, which had thrived as hunter-gatherers during the chill of the Ice Age, began to spread across the planet. This period, known as the Mesolithic Era, saw the dawn of permanent settlements and the beginnings of agriculture. But according to the intriguing and controversial Kemet theory, this era also witnessed the rise of something extraordinary in the Nile Valley. The Great Pyramids and their relationship to the River Nile reflect the sky of 12,500 years ago, not 4,500 years ago. The proponents of the Kemet theory weave a tale of an advanced civilization, one that allegedly emerged amidst these climatic upheavals. This civilization, they claim, was not just advanced for its time, but possessed knowledge and technology that would leave later societies in awe. Their mastery, it is said, extended across various domains. In the realm of astronomy, the people of Kemet supposedly had an intricate understanding of celestial bodies. They could track astronomical events with precision, knowledge that they might have used to develop sophisticated calendar systems and guide their agricultural activities. The Great Pyramid is an incredibly complicated monument, but those who, those who built it had an enormous knowledge uh, which, they, which they manifested in the Great Pyramid. But their expertise did not end with the stars. The architectural marvels of ancient Egypt, such as the pyramids, are believed by adherents of this theory to be remnants of this earlier, more sophisticated civilization. Further, this mysterious civilization is credited with extraordinary advancements in medicine and mathematics, and perhaps even in fields of energy and physics that modern science has yet to rediscover. The legacy of their knowledge, it is suggested, was far-reaching. The proponents of the Kemet theory point to various pieces of evidence to support their claims. They observe geological anomalies that mainstream archaeology might overlook or interpret differently. For instance, the erosion patterns on the Sphinx and certain features of the pyramids are argued to be much older than the established timeline suggests. The Great Sphinx was subjected to about a thousand years of heavy rainfall and that's the only time you find that heavy rainfall on the Giza Plateau is the Younger Dryas between roughly 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. You certainly didn't find it 4,500 years ago when the Sphinx was supposed to have been made. Proponents cite water erosion marks on the Sphinx, which they claim point to a construction date that predates the aridity of the Sahara Desert. 
Moreover, the theory draws on mythological and cultural parallels. It notes similarities in ancient myths, religious practices, and architectural styles across different cultures. These similarities are interpreted as echoes of a shared source of ancient wisdom, potentially originating from Kemet. According to the narrative of the Kemet theory, after a catastrophic event, the survivors of this advanced civilization dispersed globally. This diaspora, the story goes, spread their advanced knowledge far and wide. This could, as the theory suggests, explain the sudden rise of complex civilizations and monumental architecture in various parts of the world. In the annals of alternative historical narratives, the Kemet theory stands out as a captivating tale of a civilization steeped in mystery and marvel. This story begins with the assertion that an ancient civilization, referred to as Kemet, once flourished with knowledge and technologies so advanced that they remain incomprehensible even to contemporary science. The echoes of this lost civilization are believed to be found in the monumental achievements of ancient Egypt, particularly in the realms of astronomy and engineering. In the realm of engineering, the pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid of Giza, are often presented as the pinnacle of Kemet's architectural prowess. The mystery of the construction of the Great Pyramid, which contrary to archaeological views, has never been solved. Right. Nobody knows how it was done. I mean, you are looking at 6 million tons, 13-acre footprint, 481 feet tall, 2.5 million blocks of stone in its construction. how they do it? Nobody knows. It was done. The theory marvels at the precision and scale of these constructions. It questions how the ancient Egyptians of later periods, with their known tools and technologies, could achieve such feats. The meticulous alignment of the pyramids to true north, the transport and assembly of massive stone blocks and the use of advanced mathematics, including pi and the golden ratio in their design, are all highlighted as indicators of a superior technological capability. Venturing further into the realm of speculation, some proponents of the Kemet theory suggest that this civilization might have harnessed unknown forms of energy or technology. Ideas range from the use of acoustics and vibrations for stone cutting and levitation, to more esoteric notions involving the manipulation of electromagnetic fields or other unseen natural forces. The dawn of the early dynastic period heralded a monumental shift Egypt, which had been divided into upper and lower regions, was unified under the rule of King Nama, a seminal event immortalized on the famed Nama Palette. This unification gave birth to the first dynasty and set the stage for a cultural renaissance. Hieroglyphic writing emerged, a sophisticated system that allowed for intricate record-keeping and administration. Royal tombs, grand in their design, began to dot the landscape at Abydos and Saqqara, Religious practices grew more elaborate, with gods like Ra and Osiris gaining prominence, and the first pyramids, like Djoser's step pyramid designed by Imhotep, began to reach towards the heavens. The Old Kingdom, often hailed as the Age of the Pyramids, saw the construction of these iconic monuments reach its zenith. What happened was that in later times, the ancient Egyptians, who were the inheritors of the culture that originally established the Giza, that the ancient Egyptians found it necessary to restore and modify some very ancient monuments. The Great Pyramid of Giza, a marvel of engineering and architecture, stood as a testament to the pharaoh's godlike status. Art and culture flourished with the Sphinx of Giza, a colossal statue combining the body of a lion with the head of a pharaoh, embodying the period's artistic audacity. However, this golden age was not to last. Political instability and the decentralization of power eventually ushered in the first intermediate period, a time of decline and turmoil. Out of chaos, the Middle Kingdom arose, a period marked by reunification and stability under rulers like Mentuhotep II. Literature and art saw a renaissance, with works like The Tale of Sinuhe, reflecting a more realistic and individualistic portrayal of life. Trade expanded, and fortifications were strengthened, signaling a kingdom more secure and prosperous than ever. The new kingdom heralded an era of empire building, with Egypt's influence stretching from modern-day Syria to Sudan. This was the age of famous pharaohs like Hatshepsut, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, and Rameses II. Akhenaten's radical attempt at religious reform, introducing monotheistic worship of Aten, marked a brief but significant departure from traditional beliefs. Architectural achievements reached new heights, 
with the construction of grand temples at Karnak and Luxor, and the creation of the Valley of the Kings. Following the New Kingdom, Egypt entered a period of decline. The Third Intermediate Period was characterized by political fragmentation, and the Late Period saw foreign invasions and rule by Nubians, Assyrians, and Persians. The final phases of ancient Egyptian civilization were under the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty and Roman rule, marking the end of a civilization that had lasted for... But uh, what they don't like is the notion that, that certain knowledge and information accumulated by that culture was passed down all around the world, uh, so that you find the same essential ideas in Mesopotamia, right. in ancient Egypt, uh, in the Amazon rainforest, in Mexico, in Guatemala, amongst the Mayan culture, for example, the same essential ideas are being repeated. The traditional Egyptology timeline reveals a civilization of incredible depth and complexity. From their architectural feats to the intricacies of their religious beliefs and social structures, the ancient Egyptians left an indelible mark on human history. Their story, woven into the fabric of the Nile's fertile valleys, continues to captivate and enlighten, a testament to the enduring legacy of one of the world's most remarkable civilizations. In the tapestry of human history, woven with the threads of established facts and intriguing mysteries, the Kemet theory presents a fascinating narrative. Central to this story is the concept of a global cataclysm, linked to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis which is believed to have had a profound and lasting impact on human civilization, particularly on a sophisticated society known as Kemet. The stage for this narrative is set against the backdrop of the Younger Dryas, a period that occurred around 12,800 to 11,500 years ago. This era was marked by a sudden and drastic cooling of the Earth, interrupting the gradual warming that followed the last ice age, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis posits that this climatic anomaly was triggered by a comet or meteor impact, or possibly multiple impacts, around 10,900 BC. The hypothesis suggests that these cosmic collisions led to widespread fires, the creation of a dust cloud that blocked sunlight, and a resultant rapid return to cold conditions. Proponents of this hypothesis point to geological evidence like nanodiamonds and microspherules found in sediment layers as signs of this ancient cosmic event. From the perspective of the Kemet theory, this cataclysmic event is seen as the pivotal factor in the downfall of the advanced Kemet civilization. The theory suggests that the catastrophic events unleashed by the impact led to widespread destruction and loss of life, resulting in the rapid decline and eventual disappearance of Kemet. The envisioned aftermath includes massive fires, dramatic climate changes and ecological disasters that would have been devastating enough to erase much of the civilization's technological and cultural achievements. This was the 12,800 years ago was the onset of the Younger Dryads, which is a, a, a catastrophic climate episode, uh, which is where, where, where the Earth has been emerging quite slowly and almost pleasantly from the Ice Age and then suddenly goes back into a dramatic deep freeze. In the wake of this disaster, the Kemet theory weaves a tale of survival and transmission. It suggests that the survivors, carrying with them the advanced knowledge of Kemet, dispersed across the globe. These survivors, according to the theory, had a significant influence on the development of other ancient civilizations. This is often cited as the reason for the striking similarities observed in architectural styles, mythological narratives, and astronomical knowledge across various ancient cultures. However, this captivating narrative is not without its challenges and debates. One of the contentious points raised by proponents is the erosion patterns observed on the Sphinx at Giza. They argue that these patterns suggest a much older date of construction, potentially aligning with the timeline of the Kemet civilization. This claim, however, is highly debated among Egyptologists and geologists, with many attributing the erosion to known climatic and environmental factors of a later period. Similarly, questions raised about the conventional understanding of pyramid construction techniques are used to support the theory's claim of more advanced technology. Critics, on the other hand, argue that the methods proposed by mainstream archaeology are plausible and consistent with the available evidence. The theory also draws on mythological and architectural parallels across different ancient cultures, interpreting these similarities as evidence of a shared ancient knowledge base. Mainstream scholars, however, 
typically view these parallels as examples of convergent cultural development or shared human experiences and archetypes, rather than proof of a single disseminated ancient wisdom. If we're only looking for a mere reflection of ourselves, some modern researchers whose work has been buried or suppressed, I think we're getting very close to rediscovering some of the things that our ancient ancestors were up to. There are people who've been working on these things for, for decades now, basically in secret. Randall Carlson's ideas about sacred geometry in relation to ancient megalithic structures are truly interesting. He delves deep into the idea that ancient civilizations had a profound understanding of geometric principles and deliberately incorporated these into their monuments. It's a mix of mathematics and archaeology. Let's start with the basics of sacred geometry. This concept revolves around using key geometric shapes like circles, squares, triangles and hexagons believed to have mystical significance. Think about a circle representing unity or infinity and a square symbolizing stability. It's about finding deeper meaning in these fundamental shapes. In the golden section or the divine proportion, we're looking for that one magic point where the ratio of the small section is to the large section exactly as the large section is to the whole line. Then there's the golden ratio, phi. This specific ratio pops up everywhere in nature and art, and it's almost like a mathematical fingerprint of the universe. Carlson points out that many megalithic structures seem to follow this golden ratio in their design, which is pretty mind-blowing if you think about it. And we can't forget the Fibonacci sequence, that series where each number is the sum of the two before it. This sequence is found in the natural world, like in the spirals of seashells and even galaxies. Carlson suggests that this pattern of growth and expansion is reflected in the design of ancient structures. Fractals are another piece of the puzzle. These are patterns that repeat at different scales and are found in natural phenomena like coastlines and trees. The idea that ancient builders used fractals in their structures implies a deep understanding of the universe's interconnectedness. When you actually have that mindset that you're creating something that is unique and something that resonates with, with higher principles. Carlson also talks about mandalas and labyrinths. Mandalas with their intricate geometric patterns are used in Hinduism and Buddhism to represent the cosmos. Labyrinths have been used in various cultures for spiritual and meditative purposes. According to Carlson, Places like the Nazca Lines in Peru might have mandala-like designs intended for ritual use. Then there's the significance of sacred numbers, like 3, 7 and 12, which have symbolic meanings in many traditions. He argues that these numbers were intentionally used in the construction of megalithic sites, reflecting the spiritual beliefs of those who built them. One of the most intriguing aspects of sacred geometry is the alignment with celestial bodies and events. Carlson contends that these ancient structures were not just randomly placed, they were aligned with astronomical phenomena like solstices, equinoxes, and the movements of stars and planets, forming a kind of cosmic geometry. Geometry was so intrinsic to many systems, both spiritual systems and meditation systems, as well as um, you know, art and architecture and, and things like that. Randall Carlson's theories about how ancient civilizations went about quarrying and transporting massive stones are pretty intriguing. He delves into a range of methods that really make you appreciate the ingenuity of these ancient builders. Let's chat about some of these techniques. First off, Carlson talks about the use of stone hammers and chisels. Imagine ancient craftsmen shaping and extracting stones from quarries using tools made from hard stones like granite or diorite. It's a labor-intensive process, but it shows a deep understanding of the materials they were working with. Then there's the whole idea of splitting large stones from bedrock using wedges. Wooden wedges might have been driven into cracks in the rock and then soaked with water. As the wood swelled, it would have exerted force on the rock, causing it to split. It's quite clever when you think about it, using nature's own properties to get the job done. Drilling techniques are another fascinating part of Carlson's theories. He suggests that ancient builders might have used tubular drills with abrasive sand and water to bore holes in tough stones like granite. The level of precision this would require is just astounding. When it comes to extracting bigger blocks, Carlson proposes methods like cave mining or creating underground chambers within the quarry rock. 
This way, large stone blocks could be accessed and removed while still intact. Then lifting these blocks again and again, it appears in ancient, ancient Egyptian traditions. The notion that we could lift huge blocks with sound seems absurd to archaeologists, and yet it's there in the traditions of the Egyptologists. Transporting these massive stones is another hurdle altogether. Carlson suggests wooden sledges as one of the methods. These sledges would help distribute the stone's weight over a larger area, making it easier to move. And imagine using water or wet sand as a lubricant beneath these sledges. It would create a slippery surface, allowing for easier movement of these huge stones. Then there are the cylindrical wooden rollers. By placing these under the stone, builders could roll the stone forward incrementally. It would have been a continuous process, needing a steady supply of rollers. Carlson even touches on the possibility of counterweight systems being used to lift and move these stones vertically. Think about using sandbags or other stones as counterweights on one side of a fulcrum to lift the stone onto sledges or platforms. And, of course, there's the topic of ramps. The idea of building spiral or zigzagging ramps to move stones to higher levels at construction sites is another debated method. It would have allowed a gradual elevation of these massive stones to where they were needed. It's fascinating to consider all these methods. They certainly paint a picture of ancient civilizations being far more advanced and innovative in their construction techniques than we often give them credit for. Resonance frequencies, everything vibrates. Everything vibrates at a frequency, and if you know that frequency, you can control things. And it's all based upon the ancient numbers. Now, Randall Carlson's take on the precision cutting and stone joinery in ancient megalithic structures is really something to marvel at. He really drives home just how skilled these ancient builders must have been. Let's talk about some of the details he highlights. Take the Great Pyramid of Giza, for instance. Carlson often points out the incredible precision in its construction. The outer casing stones, made of Tura limestone, were fitted together with such accuracy that the joints between them were only a few millimeters wide. Imagine how smooth and shiny that surface would have been, gleaming in the sunlight. It's a testament to the incredible craftsmanship of the builders. Now achieving this kind of precision in cutting stones is no small feat, especially considering the tools available at the time. Carlson suggests that the ancient builders likely used copper chisels for the initial grooves and diorite pounding stones for the finer finishing. This combination allowed for the precise shaping of the stones. And then there's the grinding technique using abrasive materials like sand and water with these tools to achieve the smoothness and precision of those cut surfaces. It's like ancient craftsmanship meeting an almost modern engineering precision. Of course, some alternative theorists, including Carlson, speculate about more advanced or lost technologies like focused sunlight or sound vibrations. But these ideas are pretty controversial and not widely accepted in mainstream archaeology. When it comes to stone joinery, Carlson highlights techniques like dovetailing, seen in the construction of megalithic walls. This technique, where wedge-shaped projections and grooves are carved into stone blocks, creates a stable and secure connection. It's seen in ancient Inca architecture and showcases advanced masonry skills. Then there's the use of interlocking blocks. In some structures, the stones are designed to interlock with neighboring ones, ensuring stability and integrity. This kind of precision in stone cutting and shaping is crucial for achieving seamless connections. Carlson also talks about dry stone construction, like what you see in Machu Picchu. This method assembles stones without mortar or cement, relying instead on careful selection and placement of stones. It's a clear indicator of the craftsmanship and planning that went into these ancient structures. And let's not forget about the complex masonry patterns. The intricate patterns, like herringbone or alternating stone courses, not only add structural stability, but also aesthetic beauty to these megalithic constructions. My contention is what we're really seeing seven, eight, nine thousand years ago is not the origins of civilization, but the rebooting of civilization. Moving on again, Randall Carlson's theory about civilizations existing during the last ice age is something straight out of a fascinating blend of archaeology and mythology. It's pretty interesting how he steps away from mainstream archaeological thought. He suggests that back in the Pleistocene epoch, which wrapped up around 11,700 years ago, there were advanced civilizations. It's intriguing because he believes these societies were more than just surviving the harsh ice age. They were actually thriving and developing complex technologies and knowledge systems. 
Carlson's idea that these ancient civilizations had advanced architectural, astronomical, and mathematical knowledge really makes you think. It's like he's saying they were capable of constructing intricate structures and had a deep understanding of celestial movements, something we usually don't attribute to societies from that time. When it comes to evidence, he points to the megalithic structures scattered across the globe. Think about the pyramids of Egypt, Stonehenge in England, or the megalithic temples of Malta. According to him, the sheer scale, precision, and architectural complexity of these structures hint at a level of skill and knowledge that wouldn't have been possible without some advanced understanding. Carlson also believes that fragments of knowledge from these Ice Age civilizations have been passed down symbolically through myths, legends, and even architectural practices. It's a fascinating idea that these stories we've grown up with might actually contain hidden truths about sophisticated societies lost to history. You're talking about a, a very energetic intertidal zone. And anything that's there, short of large megalithic blocks, is going to be utterly obliterated by the time the process is, is through. Randall Carlson really has a way of bringing a whole new perspective to how we look at ancient megalithic structures. He dives into how the ancient builders incorporated geometric precision and carefully selected specific stone types, suggesting they had a pretty advanced understanding of geometry and geology. It's pretty fascinating stuff. And it's not just about geometry on the ground. Carlson points out that these structures often align with astronomical events like solstices and equinoxes. Take Stonehenge or the Great Pyramids, for example. Their orientation with celestial bodies suggests that the builders of these megaliths had a deep connection with the cosmos. It's like they were linking heaven and earth through their constructions. Then there's the whole aspect of selecting different types of stones. It wasn't just about what was available, it was about understanding the properties of each stone. For the parts of structures that needed to bear more weight, they'd choose something dense and durable like granite. But for parts that were more decorative or didn't need to support as much weight, they might use softer stones like limestone or sandstone. It shows they had a good grasp of geology and were thoughtful about the longevity and durability of their creations. The aesthetic aspect was also key. The ancient builders considered the color, texture and patterns of the stones. The way different types of stones contrasted with each other could really enhance the visual and artistic appeal of these structures. In essence, Carlson's theories paint a picture of ancient builders as not just skilled laborers, but as sophisticated architects and engineers. They were creating these incredible structures with a deep understanding of geometry, astronomy, and geology. And they were doing it with an eye for beauty as well. It's a perspective that adds a whole new layer of awe to these ancient wonders. They had a tradition that at that time, the world had been previously destroyed and they dreaded lest a similar catastrophe would, at the end of a cycle, annihilate the human race. It's features like this that are just unequivocal in terms of realizing that this really happened. Human sacrifices were offered while the entire population passed the night upon their knees awaiting their doom. These people imagined the world would end. The Younger Dryas period, named after the Dryas octopetala flower which thrived in cold conditions and became common in Europe during this time, presents a fascinating chapter in Earth's history. This period, spanning approximately from 12,800 to 11,500 years ago, marks a transition from the late Pleistocene to the early Holocene. It's characterized by a dramatic downturn in temperature, disrupting the gradual warming trend following the last glacial maximum the coldest phase of the last ice age. This abrupt shift led to a drop in temperatures estimated to be between two to six degrees Celsius in a relatively short time. When the world went cold again during the Younger Dryas, the water, the melt water flowing from the glaciers into the oceans declined if it didn't stop altogether. And then about 1300 years later, boom, it started up again and that gave us Meltwater Pulse 1B. The effects of the Younger Dryas were not just confined to the North Atlantic region, but were felt globally, with evidence of climatic changes found in Asia, South America, and even the Southern Hemisphere. The resulting cold and dry conditions had a significant impact on vegetation patterns, 
ecosystems and human populations dependent on hunting and foraging. Adding to the intrigue of this period is the proposed comet impact hypothesis. This theory posits that a comet or fragments of one struck Earth or exploded in the atmosphere, potentially in multiple waves. The impact, likened to the energy release of several nuclear explosions, is thought to have triggered widespread wildfires, consuming vast areas of forests and grasslands. These fires likely contributed to the formation of the black mat layer, a carbon-rich deposit found at numerous younger, drier sites. Supporters of this hypothesis point to evidence such as microspherules and nanodiamonds, typically formed under high-impact conditions, and elevated levels of rare elements like iridium and platinum to bolster their claims. The reason it's black is because it's so loaded with soot, which suggests wildfires, perhaps on a global or at least a hemispheric scale, that preceded the tremendous flooding that followed in its wake. Charcoal and soot layers in geological records also align with this time frame, suggesting extensive burning. However, the hypothesis is not without its challenges and controversies. One major point of contention is the absence of a clear impact crater, typically expected from such an event. Proponents argue that the comet might have disintegrated in the atmosphere or struck an ice sheet, leaving no obvious crater. Additionally, critics propose alternative explanations for the climatic shift, such as changes in ocean circulation patterns or volcanic activity. The debate continues as the evidence for a comet impact, while compelling, is not universally accepted. The Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, which suggests a comet impact around 12,800 years ago, is a topic that really captures the imagination with its blend of geological mysteries and climatic upheaval. At the heart of this hypothesis is an array of geological evidence. For instance, nano-diamonds, these tiny diamonds formed under extreme pressure, have been found across North America, Europe and parts of Asia in sediment layers dating back to the Younger Dryas period. Their presence in such widespread locations hints at a high-energy event on a global scale. Similarly intriguing are microspherules, small spherical particles often linked to extraterrestrial impacts or volcanic eruptions. The high concentrations of these particles found in the younger Dryas boundary layers further point to a large impact event, but there's more. We see other materials like elevated levels of iridium, rare on Earth but common in meteorites, and magnetic grains containing iridium. Plus, the discovery of soot and carbon-rich layers in these same sediments suggests widespread burning, likely due to wildfires ignited by the impact. Now, these shock-synthesized hexagonal diamonds only occur. They, there's no natural, known natural process that will produce them except for the intense heat and pressures of a cosmic impact. Evidence of impact material and the extinction of the megafauna 12,900 years ago. The impact material contains iron oxide spherules in a glassy iron silica matrix, which is one indicator of a possible meteorite impact. Then there are the Carolina Bays, these elliptical depressions along the U.S. Atlantic seaboard. Their origin is hotly debated, but some researchers think they might be craters from secondary impacts of comet fragments, aligning in a pattern that could suggest a comet coming from the northwest. The climatic impact of this proposed event is just as dramatic. Imagine a comet impact throwing massive amounts of dust, soot and particulate matter into the atmosphere. This debris spreading globally would have blocked sunlight, leading to a sudden drop in temperatures. This is exactly what we see when we look at climate models and ice core data from Greenland and Antarctica, which show a sharp temperature decline coinciding with the time of the proposed impact. The cooling effect was particularly strong in the Northern Hemisphere, with temperature drops estimated between 3 to 11 degrees Celsius in some regions. And if that wasn't enough, the comet impact could have also disrupted major ocean currents, like the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, leading to even further cooling, especially in the North Atlantic. During the transition from the Pleistocene epoch to the Holocene, which roughly overlaps with the Younger Dryas period, Something dramatic happened in North America, the extinction of numerous large mammal species. This included some iconic megafauna like woolly mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths, and even the North American camel and horse. These extinctions weren't evenly spread across regions, with North America being particularly hard hit. 
Now, the intriguing part is the timing of these extinctions, which coincides with the Younger Dryas period. This has led proponents of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis to suggest a connection between the comet impact and these mass extinctions. They argue that the comet impact would have triggered a cascade of ecological disruptions, including wildfires, climate change, and disruptions in the food chain. These sudden environmental changes might have outpaced the ability of these large species to adapt, ultimately leading to their demise. However, it's important to note that there are opposing views. Some scientists argue for alternative explanations, such as the overkill hypothesis, which suggests that human overhunting played a significant role in these extinctions. Others propose natural climatic changes independent of any impact event as potential drivers. Now, in these events that terminated the Ice Age, roughly half the great megafaunal species on Earth died out very rapidly. All of a sudden, around 12,000 to 13,000 years ago, a huge number of fossil remains were introduced into the environment. And so what, and then at the end of this, these species extinct, are extinct. They don't exist anymore. Like it says here, each square represents a fossil specimen of an extinct megafaunal species. So the debate continues, and the impact hypothesis is just one of several competing theories. The younger Dryas impact hypothesis doesn't stop at biological consequences. It also has implications for early human populations, particularly the Clovis culture. This culture, known for its distinctive stone tools, was widespread across North America during the same time frame as the Younger Dryas. Researchers have noticed a connection between the apparent disappearance or transformation of the Clovis culture and the onset of the Younger Dryas. This suggests that the proposed impact event might have significantly disrupted the way of life for these ancient people. The rapid shift to colder, drier conditions during the Younger Dryas would have undoubtedly affected the availability of food and resources for these hunter-gatherer populations. The changes in megafauna populations, which were a crucial resource for Clovis people, would have compounded these challenges. Archaeological evidence supports this idea of adaptation. There's a noticeable change in human tool technology and subsistence patterns after the Younger Dryas, reflecting a response to new environmental conditions and available resources. This period also marks the emergence of more regionally diverse cultures compared to the previously widespread Clovis technology. Carlson draws attention to rapid temperature changes in Earth's history, particularly emphasizing events like the Younger Dryas, a period marked by a sudden return to near-glacial conditions after a period of warming. His perspective challenges the conventional view of gradual climate shifts and instead suggests a dynamic and potentially unstable climate system. He points to historical precedents, such as the bolling alarod warming period before the Younger Dryas, where rapid shifts in climate are evident in paleoclimatic records. These events have been studied to understand the sensitivity and resilience of the Earth's climate system. One of Carlson's intriguing hypotheses is the idea that comet and asteroid impacts may have played a more significant role in Earth's history than currently recognized. He speculates that these impacts could have triggered ice ages or abrupt climatic shifts, potentially even contributing to mass extinctions. In the context of the Younger Dryas, Carlson and other proponents of the impact hypothesis argue that a cosmic impact event was a primary trigger for the abrupt climate change observed during this period. They point to geological and ice core evidence to support their claims. Ice core records, particularly from Greenland and Antarctica, offer detailed insights into past climates. Carlson highlights layers in these cores that correspond to rapid changes in temperature and atmospheric composition, which he interprets as evidence for catastrophic events. Other geological markers, like sediment layers rich in iridium or elements linked to extraterrestrial materials, further support the impact hypothesis. The presence of shock synthesized hexagonal and other nanometer sized diamonds in younger driest boundary sediments in association with soot and other wildfire indicators is consistent with a cosmic impact event of 12.9 kA. Randall Carlson's theory proposes the existence of advanced human civilizations that thrived long before the commonly accepted timeline of known history, potentially even preceding the last ice age, which ended roughly 11,700 years ago. 
This challenges the conventional view that attributes the emergence of civilization to much later periods, such as the Sumerian and ancient Egyptian civilizations that arose around 6,000 years ago. According to Carlson, these prehistoric societies weren't just technologically advanced, they also possessed profound spiritual understanding and wisdom. He speculates that their technological capabilities could have included advanced architecture, astronomy, and other sciences, far surpassing what is typically associated with prehistoric cultures. To support his theory, Carlson points to the complexity and sophistication of ancient structures like the pyramids of Egypt, Stonehenge, and various megalithic sites worldwide. He argues that the precision in construction, astronomical alignments, and engineering skills evident in these structures suggest a higher level of knowledge and technological capability than mainstream archaeology typically acknowledges. Many of these ancient structures exhibit precise alignments with astronomical phenomena, such as solstices and equinoxes, which Carlson suggests is evidence of advanced astronomical knowledge. For instance, the layout of the Giza pyramid complex is aligned with the stars in the belt of the constellation Orion, while Stonehenge aligns with the solstices. One of Carlson's key ideas is that these advanced ancient civilizations might have met their downfall due to catastrophic events like comet impacts or other natural disasters. These disasters could have wiped out significant populations, leading to the loss of knowledge and technology. He also posits that remnants of this lost knowledge can be found in mythologies, religious texts, and ancient symbols across different cultures. According to Carlson, these ancient stories and symbols may contain allegorical references to real events and the lost advanced knowledge of these prehistoric civilizations 